uh, Lansing City Council, March 22nd. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Um, certainly. Council Member Betts. President participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Um, Council Member Dunbar. Council Member Dunbar is present. Uh, Council Member Garza. I am present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Hussein. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Jackson. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Spadafor. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Spitzley. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. And Council Member Wood. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. And has Council Member Dunbar joined us? It looks like she's just on her way in, Mr. Clerk. So why don't we just give her a second to mark herself as present. Council Member Dunbar, are you here? There you are. I am present participating remotely from South Lansing. Trying again. Look at that. I can put a flashbulb right in my face. And <laughs> Urgh. As the okay. sun goes down. As the sun goes down. Yeah. Uh, we have eight members present to quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the first item on our agenda is our meditation and pledge of allegiance. Is there anybody uh, council members, uh, the mayor or the clerk would wish that we keep in our thoughts this evening. You know, it's fine. Uh, okay, seeing so none, I will Same just, thing I did. Okay. Wait, wait, I have one. I have one, Mr. President. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I don't know who knows this and who doesn't. I just found out. Um, I would like us all to keep in our prayers um, Pastor Jeff Jesse Brown of Rivers of Life Church who I was informed passed away today. He had been um, sick, although I didn't realize he was that sick. I talked to him last week um, and he passed away today. So if we can all keep in our prayers, Pastor Jesse Brown of Rivers of Life Church in Lansing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, seeing no others, I'll ask that the council um, and our public please keep in mind uh, Pastor Jesse Brown and his and family this evening as we reflect. Uh, please join me in a moment of uh, silent meditation. Thank you. Also, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank so, you. So thank you. We are to the consideration of late items. Uh, Mr. Vice President, do you have a late item for us tonight? Or do I, one moment, let me see if I've got, I know we have one. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to unmute myself. Yeah, so what we have uh, today is we actually have a um, late item uh, that pertains to the CDBG home and ESG allocation. Um, we do this every single year. Um, unfortunately, um, our economic development and planning uh, de department, they just, they just missed uh, the deadline. And so um, this would be for referral only. I would assume that it would be referred to uh, Committee of the Whole. Um, and it would be to introduce and set at some point a public hearing for April 26th. So with that being said, I would move to uh, suspend rule nine to allow for um, the late item. Very good. Um, yes, and you're correct. It is for referral tonight. So um, we'll need, a, we have a motion in front of us um, to suspend the rule to allow for the consideration of the late item for the referral. Um, is there any discussion? All right, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we have uh, Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Vets. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. A A zero and A is the item will be added uh, for referral, uh, which takes us to the um, special ceremonies and presentations. And we have the fiscal year 2021 to 2022 budget presentation. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Tonight we have with us Mayor Shore and his finance team to present to us their budget for the year. 
Um, that should have been dropped in your mailbox earlier today. If you hadn't seen it already, it should be there. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna turn it over to you. This starts our budget process that will conclude on May 17th. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have been working on this right up until this morning. My apologies for getting you the budget book today. We had hoped for Friday, but we worked on it through the weekend and into this morning. Um, so today we present to, to you, the city council, the administration's 2021 uh, budget proposal. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of a, a few highlights and then uh, Rob and or Jake will give you the top lines and then we can take any questions or if you want to just chew on it, we can answer questions over the next few months. Um, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, so uh, I do look forward to the conversation and discussion with you all about this. Um, as you all know, we're dealing with the impacts of COVID and the shutdowns of businesses and people working remotely and, and some layoffs in some industries. Um, you all know we cut $12.5 million last year um, between the budget proposal and when we passed it. Um, we also know that tax revenues are generally down for the pandemic. They're down between 20 and 25%, which is actually worse than the Great Recession when the city saw a 15% reduction over two years. So what we have projections for revenues, um, please remember that some are gonna continue to be in flux as we look at the future of the coronavirus, COVID-19, and see how it affects the workers and the businesses in our city. Um, we don't yet know how long state employees will be working from home. We don't know how long retail and restaurants will be limited capacity or if they'll have to shut down again. I, I really hope not. Um, certainly we have vaccinations and we continue to strongly encourage everyone to get the vaccination. Um, but the sooner we get to herd immunity, the sooner we can get people back to work and back to our businesses um, and state government, which of course is one of our biggest employers. So we do have some good news for the current uh, the, the current year budget, the one that we're finishing up now that will be finished up in, in the end of June, um, the budget book that you have will reflect additional dollars added to the current budget. Uh, we received dollars from the federal government that we use to assist many of our departments and those dollars are reflected in this budget. Uh, it includes uh, $5.9 million from the public safety, public health reimbursement and one in a, about 1.4 million for the coronavirus local government grants, which were part of the 2020 CARES legislation. Um, you'll also in the current year budget see a two and a half million dollar increase in our reserves uh, for the current year as we were able to compile and file the previously unreported uh, Affordable Care Act information for the city uh, to the federal government for years 2015, 16, and 17. So we we're able to reverse the, the amount owed to the federal government. So you'll see an increase of two and a half million dollars. Um, moving into, into the, the budget proposal for, um, for next year for the, uh, the 2022 budget, um, certainly, you all know we have good news and that the federal government passed the American Rescue Plan, which will allow us to, to backfill some of the losses that we have in the current budget. Um, the budget book in front of you uh, backfills about 15 and a quarter million dollars in income tax losses, um, which uh, was a hit to our general fund over the course of the pandemic. It backfills about $700,000 for our EDC, which we spent to assist our small businesses here in Lansing. Um, it backfills about $8 million in parking losses to that enterprise fund. Uh, and it includes about one and a half million in losses to LEPFA for the closed Lansing Center and for the stadium losses. And we'll ensure that we can reopen the Lansing Center and it'll, it will ensure that we can reopen the Lansing Center and have groups in there once again, um, hopefully soon. Um, we were also able to backfill uh, and include in this budget dollars uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute for the neighborhood assistance, for the arts, sister cities, and my brother's keeper, uh, facade and things like that. Um, so we restored those cuts and uh, were able to reinstate those into the current budget. Um, but just so that everyone remembers, it's not just our general fund that faces challenges. Like I said, the Lansing Center has been closed for over a year. Our parking fund faces challenges. Um, so we're gonna restore dollars into those losses as well. Um, the one thing that was not allowed in, uh, well, two things that were not allowed in the federal um, rescue or the American Rescue Act were dollars for roads, unfortunately. Um, but uh, that's because the, there's going to be a federal infrastructure bill. And I am optimistic that they will pass that. And I'll continue to work with the US Conference of Mayors on that. Um, they also didn't allow dollars to be used for pensions. Um, and we're still waiting on the US Department of Treasury for some of the other specifics of these funds. So in the current budget in front of you, um, we added uh, everything that I mentioned. Um, I also added a few new uh, items to this budget that uh, many were, were asked for by city council and from, uh, from other partners. And, and I'm proud to have been able to work with you all to get them in. Um, as you know, gun violence continues to be an issue in Lansing and everywhere. 
Um, we'll continue to take many guns off the street through our violent crime initiative, um, but we've heard a lot uh, at city council and from the county and, and from other partners about the advanced peace initiative to reduce gun violence by utilizing street outreach. Um, and I have included funding for that program for the 2022 calendar year in the community agency section of the budget. Um, so as long as Ingham County also provides the funding that they're planning to commit, um, then I have put that money in the budget for your consideration to include um, when you pass the budget in May. Uh, I also want to point out we have dollars in. Uh, I'm one of the first members of Cincinnati Mayor John Cranley's um, gun violence uh, consortium. And as part of this effort, we're piloting new gun technologies here in Lansing that will prevent guns from being used by anyone other than their owners, um, whether illegal guns or you know accidental or kids getting a hold of their parents' guns. Um, we all saw that last year and we had a young person um, kill themselves with their, their mother's gun. Um, the technology our police officers are gonna be piloting will help save lives and our membership in this consortium will help us to be leaders in this effort. So that will be a part of, of our gun violence efforts as well. Um, we also continue, need to continue to ensure we're not criminalizing those with, with mental illness or homelessness or uh, other issues which may result in a visit from a police officer. Uh, we don't criminalize these people here in Lansing and I'm proud of that. Um, we have made Lansing the first city in the state to have a social worker working hand in hand with our police department. And my budget proposes to add a second social worker to assist Jan Bidwell and to help with those challenges. And again, that was something that I believe you all included in your budget priorities resolution. Um, additionally, we are, uh, I have included in my budget, my proposed budget, funding for what are called two community health workers uh, in conjunction with the Ingham County Health Department. These are social workers that assist emergency dispatch so that non-emergency and social needs calls go to social service agencies. Um, we piloted this with the county um, previously under a grant that was provided to us. Um, and this will ensure that social service needs are connected with social service providers rather than sending our emergency personnel there when they need to be in other places helping out. Um, so I'm excited that we can once again work with the county health department and I proposed including two of those as well. So you'll see two within our emergency um, services and two for our police department for a total of four social workers. Um, to ensure better transparency and faster response for those who seek public information, I included a new uh, additional FOIA officer in our police department. Um, you all know FOIA, we get a lot of FOIA requests, especially for body camera footage, and it's really tough and time consuming um, as these videos have to be watched and redacted. So this will help get that information out faster. Um, also in the police department, I included new radio testing equipment for the police department which is needed as a result of conversions to finalize the process. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, to ensure that we're safe in our courts and, and uh, in City Hall, we included funding for the requested new metal detectors that they have asked for. Um, it's been a request for many years from the courts and, and we provided those to ensure safety and security. Uh, in the fire department, we know that we have incredible staff in our emergency operations center. Uh, from the flood a few years ago to all their pandemic work for the last year, they've done a great job and they had some necessary funding needs. So we included funding for them. Uh, we also included funding to finalize our siren upgrades. Um, so that way we can finally get that fixed and make sure that our sirens, our warning sirens work. Um, I'll also point out here, while not in our budget, our fire depart department has major needs for firehouse repairs and replacement and for training. Um, and we're exploring a bond to take to the voters. We recently had a fire department bond roll off and we're exploring a bond to take to voters um, I am not including that as part of this budget, um, but we are going to get that to you soon, um, hopefully for the November ballot, but we're still working that out. Um, but we will discuss that with council in the very near future. Uh, a few others are, are uh, our chief strategy officer, Judy Keeler. She's been working really hard to, to identify and create efficiencies, but she needs some assistance. So you'll see an increase in the mayor's office budget so that she can have some needed temporary assistance. Um, she's going to utilize a, a business analyst position that will look help her research and navigate the many ideas and the many different departments in the city to save some money. And she is confident that is going to save more money than it costs. Um, we've made great progress with roads and sidewalks. Uh, we budgeted 6.15 million from our Act 51 funding for sidewalk gap repair, major streets, local streets and bridge rehab. Uh, I also added in, added in dollars from the general fund for sidewalks. Um, so combined with the dollars that, that we have and the dollars that we'll be putting in uh, we'll have about $500,000 in sidewalk money and uh, Director Kilpatrick has indicated he'll probably use 250 in the spring and 250 in the fall. Um, so we'll make sure to, to fund sidewalk replacement. Um, for Councilman Garza and Councilman Hussein, uh, we've included our $135,000 for the renewal of the lease for the South Lansing Library. 
Uh, I want to thank both you gentlemen. Um, both of you were very, very helpful as we uh, negotiated the new lease for that. Um, you were both tremendous advocates for the South Side, and I do want to thank you both for that. Um, and we have finalized that uh, lease, and, and the funding is here for this. And I told, I think I told Adam I would mention that. Um, we also included the additional $130,000 as a result of the HRCS Basic Human Needs uh, Ordinance that was passed two weeks ago at Council. Uh, the additional $130,000 just for equity efforts. I know Councilman Spadafore um, pushed that, and uh, Council President Spadafore pushed that. Um, so it'll be an extra $130,000. It'll go specifically for equity efforts through our Basic Human Needs Fund. Um, and uh, we'll have that list to you. Um, you know, Councilman Wood always asks, and she should. Um, we'll have that list to you, but because of the recent changes in the ordinance, it's not ready just yet, but we'll have it to you before you start considering uh, Kim Coleman is on top of that. Um, talking about equity, uh, in addition to the My Brother's Keeper funds that we, um, we put back into the budget, um, we're also recommending investment and funding for the, the racial justice and equity efforts, including training, policy updates, and other implementation of the, uh, the Racial Justice and Equity Alliance report that we expect to receive in a few weeks. Um, for our parks infrastructure, we're mostly going along with the Parks Board recommendations. Uh, I know several of you have served on the Parks Board, I think uh, Councilman Spitzley and Councilman Hussein. Um, so we're gonna go along with those recommendations, um, but we are recommending a little bit extra grant match money for, um, for fit lots and other things like that, um, which have been tremendously successful um, and for other similar spaces, which are popular in the city. Um, Last but not least, uh, for legacy costs, um, we do have an additional three and a half million dollars in savings every year due to the recent retiree health care changes. Uh, but our pension boards also just did the responsible thing and adjusted assumptions for our pensions. Um, and that'll ensure that our estimates are correct long term. We'll also increase our costs short term. Um, so we'll see an increase in pension costs. Um, but again, it was the right thing to do because it was responsible. Um, so for our legacy costs, we broke that out in the budget. It used to be um, they would be part of every department. Now we have taken it out of each department and created its own separate category. Uh, and that will go from 40 million last year to 45 million in the proposed, uh, in the proposed budget. So with all of that being said, the budget before you um, is still projected to end the fiscal year with about 14 million in our fund balance, which is a significant increase. Um, brings us closer to the 12% that we strive to get to. Um, and as a result of the, the hard work done, um, I'll note that we don't need to utilize the tax anticipation note that council uh, previously authorized, um, so that's good news. Um, we're building back our reserves while, while making sure we pay our bills. Um, we're gonna continue to look for possible revenue enhancements. Uh, Judy Keeler is working on some really exciting things and looking at both savings and revenues and growth. Uh, Andy Kilpatrick is working with Johnson Controls to find building efficiencies that can make us more sustainable and save money. Desiree Kirkland is gonna be using the state tapes uh, to see how we can increase income tax collections. Uh, Robert Whittigan is, is implementing stronger financial controls through the city, um, and there are just a variety of others. So um, the, the last thing I'll mention, I know I said that before, is uh, Governor Whitmer also proposed in her state budget um, to basically repay cities for income taxes that they've lost due to COVID. Uh, and in her budget proposal, the city is supposed to get about $6 million. Um, we did not include that in this budget because it hasn't passed the legislature yet. Uh, and it potentially won't until either July or maybe even September. But when it does pass the legislature, we will come to you with a supplemental appropriation for October because um, that's when the state uh, fiscal year starts. So when that budget money gets in, um, we will come to you with an appropriation for the additional $6 million. Uh, I'm optimistic about this budget and that it addresses our needs and priorities, but we continue to, to look at, at all options and, and work with you all. I know you all have other priorities that I'd like to continue to talk about. Um, but uh, that's those kind of the, the highlights and Rob and Jake can quickly give you the top lines and then we can take any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. So I was trying to go as quick as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There's a lot in there. Um, so would Bro Bro Jake like to go now or does council have questions before we start on that? I raise your hand now if you'd like to ask questions now or if you want to move on to uh, Rob and Jake and then we can come back for questions. Looks like you, if the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Whittigan, Mr. Bauer. Let's see, do I have a screen sharing rights here? I do, yes. Excellent. Yes. All right. And so you should be able to see, hopefully, a full screen of a PowerPoint. 
uh, unfortunately, the mayor was uh, very thorough with his uh, comments tonight. And so what I'll be able to tell you uh, today will be fairly uh, little to add on top of that. Uh, overall, this is our fiscal year 2022. Citywide, we're looking to spend about $237.1 million. This is a 1.2% increase from previous years. Uh, one of our goals this year has been uh, budget transparency. And so you'll notice that we've broken out uh, internal service charges such as uh, pension and OPEB costs, uh, IT, fleet equipment. Uh, we have broken these out of departments to uh, show them separately so you can see uh, more accurately the relative costs of uh, general public services, uh, police, fire, community development, general government, rec and culture, uh, and just get a broader idea of year-to-year uh, -year changes as you look through the uh, details of our budget. Overall, we are fairly uh, happy to continue support for infrastructure and for the community in our budget. Uh, that includes about 2.7 million for major streets and bridges, 1.8 million for local street repairs, and 225,000 for new sidewalks, uh, repairs, gap closure, and trailways. Moving on to the general fund, uh, that our budget is 151.2 million. This is a 10% increase from our projected fiscal 21 budget. Uh, overall, about 5% of that comes from the enormous cuts that we took from uh, due to COVID that has been restored in part uh, thanks to the assistance of the federal government, uh, helping the city of Lansing build back better and so forth. Uh, overall, we restore fund balance to 14.6 million, uh, which is a uh, major accomplishment of the city. Uh, we have continued uh, support for neighborhoods and economic development, uh, included funding for art and facade improvements. And we also have taken into consideration the increase in human service ordinance uh, in re addressing racial justice and equity, uh, including about 135,000 as part of that formula. We also include 300,000 in the human, uh, uh, human resources budget for uh, general training and fulfilling the recommendations of the mayor's uh, racial justice alliance board. Uh, looking at the general fund, you'll see that uh, retirement and fixed benefits continue to be uh, the vast majority of or, uh, the largest uh, cut of our pie here, uh, followed by police, fire, general government, public service. Uh, we're happy to have 6% uh, uh, combined in community development, recreation, culture, 4%, uh, and then maintaining our city infrastructure, allowing us to be here today uh, with information technology and other costs. Our revenues come from uh, four main sources. So property taxes are the best uh, majority at 35, followed by income taxes being 22%, uh, one of the more variable sources of our budget. Uh, return on equity is 19%, and state revenues come out to about 15%. Of these revenues, property taxes are the most stable uh, at this time. Income taxes face a lot of uncertainty. Uh, return on equity is a fixed payment for this year. So we've negotiated, as you remember, uh, fixed $25 million payments uh, for fiscal years 21 and 22. And then state shared revenues uh, are the assistance we get from the state, of course. Looking at property taxes, uh, the city's millage levy is 19.44 mills. Uh, back in 2013, uh, voters approved a four mil increase on top of the 15.44 mills being levied at the time. Uh, five, mil, five mils of these 19.44 uh, mills are dedicated towards public safety and uh, infrastructure. So that amounts to 7 million for police and fire, 4.7 million for roads and parks, 34 million uh, not assigned. For the fiscal 22 budget, we have uh, taken into account increased tax appeals anticipated uh, relative to previous years. Income tax estimates include uh, data from early tax refunds. Uh, there's been a significant impact due to remote work. Uh, the treasurer has been 
uh, very deep in uh, re analyzing returns from residents versus non-residents. Uh, there's continued <clears throat> there's continued uncertainty in this uh, area of our budget uh, due to the COVID-19 emergency uncertainties regarding return to in-person and long-term economic impacts from uh, businesses downtown and uh, their ability to withstand the short-term uh, pressures of COVID-19. Uh, operationally, we're uh, happy to report that the Treasury is accepting uh, L1040EZ uh, tax forms, and so that will be available on the city website. State revenues. Revenue sharing is coming about to uh, 15.6 million. We get about 3.2 million for our reimbursement for the fire services, uh, which comes to the uh, share of our fire department budget that goes towards protecting uh, state owned facilities. Uh, a personal property tax reimbursement uh, budgeted at 900,000 and medical marijuana at 350,000. Uh, overall, you can see in this chart, the effects of state revenue sharing cuts over the past 20 years. As you can see uh, from 2002 levels, if we held those constant, uh, we would receive, be receiving an annual amount of approximately $8.5 million over the cumulative period between 2002 and 2022, our projected budget that amounts to $149 million uh, this, that the state has taken from our budget. So for pension and OPEP, uh, we are increasing our contributions by 3.05 million for police and fire pensions and 1.505 million for ERS pension payments. Uh, police and fire is entirely supported by the general fund. The uh, 1.05 is a mix between uh, the various funds of the city. Overall, about 76% of uh, our fixed benefits are covered by the uh, general fund. This comes to a total of about 60.7 million overall, 46.4 going to the general fund. This is an area too where uh, this is all based on our assumptions. And so you'll recall that pursuant to the advice of our pension boards, we have um, adopted more conservative estimates for our budget. Uh, and so as you can see here, the pension and healthcare payments for the future can be affected by market conditions of which uh, COVID-19 is certainly a very strong reality there. Moving on to staffing. Our public service department, we are happy to uh, roll out the city 311 program. The intent of this being that a citizen can call uh, this single hotline across the city and their, uh, anything that they're uh, working to solve will be uh, helped by an individual employee who will uh, help them through the process start to finish. We have budgeted new staff for this, uh, but are expecting transfers from existing positions to offset some of the cost. Uh, we have included a social work in our budget uh, to provide additional support to the community. And for operational transparency, we are adding a FOIA analyst to provide more timely response to public requests. Overall, we are uh, seeking to respond directly to fiscal challenges, uh, in part due to the uh, support of our state and federal government where possible. Uh, we are continuing to invest in public safety and infrastructure uh, while also supporting our neighborhoods, uh, arts and culture, and local community at large. We're including funds to address uh, racial justice and equity, including implementing the Mayor's Racial Justice and Equity Alliance Plan. We're funding neighborhood grants, art grants, sister cities, and my brother's keeper. And we're implementing best practices citywide uh, to effectively serve the Lansing community in ways uh, large and small uh, to the best of our ability. And that pretty much concludes our presentation. So we will be available over the uh, next period of uh, several months as you uh, adopt uh, discuss and eventually adopt a uh, budget for the city of Lansing. And so we look forward to uh, the questions that we'll get from you. 
Thank you, Jake. Uh, Rob, did you have anything before I go on to questions? Uh, no, I guess I could quickly, as I, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, and Mayor's mentioned um, the, the proposed federal dollars, which were passed as part of the uh, uh, American Recovery uh, Protection Act, I believe. So there's the, the payment breakdown is uh, there's two payments. We'll, we'll get approximately half within the first 60 days and approximately the second half one year after the first check is received. Um, the number has been reported, uh, or the numbers have been reported pr pretty widely at 51 million. Uh, I did find out today on a, on a presentation with the uh, Michigan Municipal League that the 51 million is what the congressional staffers uh, came up with. That's subject to final um, auditing from the U.S. Department of Treasury, uh, and they believe that should be done in mid-April. Uh, we do have until the end of 2024 to spend the money uh, you know, slowly and, and man, you know, the, the purpose of this is to manage the, the long tail of this economic impact caused by the pandemic. Um, so it's not recommended that we spend it all this year or, not, or, or within two years, but to, to slowly kind of burn it down between now and 2024. Um, we, we are still waiting from additional guidance from U.S. Department of Treasury. So uh, that's anticipated in May, May to April, which will be before uh, the, the budget starts here on July 1. So we won't be spending dollars until we get that final guidance from uh, U.S. Treasury. But, and if you have any questions on that specifically that haven't been answered, uh, get them to Jake or I or, or Mayor, and we're able to submit questions to the National League of Cities, and they're able to work with uh, U.S. Treasury to ask those questions and then they'll eventually be put in the Q and A. So for, you know, perfect example is, is pensions are specifically excluded from um, being paid down with these dollars. However, it doesn't mention at all OPEB or retiree healthcare. So does that mean, you know, could we use that to fund retiree healthcare? Good question. Uh, we did submit that to the National League of Cities and we hope to find out um, in mid April or so when they release more details on it. So. The only other thing I think Jake mentioned in his email um, for all you budget gurus out there anxiously awaiting the line item uh, detailed budget for some leisurely reading, uh, we are uh, anticipate, or, you know, we anticipate that request and we are, um, it'll be provided to council, council members and the internal auditor as supplementary, supplementary information by Friday. So we will get that out shortly. And uh, we, and we look for, like Jake said, we look forward to, Further discussion at future council meetings as we embark on this uh, three month three month uh, long budget journey. Thank you very much, Mr. Bacon. Uh We have three hands up so far. We'll start with Councilmember Spitzley, then Councilmember Garza. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to know: Do you know I, I, we're getting the line item information this Friday? Where, um, when you talk about the racial equity, the My Brother's Keeper, and some of those other ones, where are those line items located? What department will those be located? My Brother's yeah. Keeper has always been in the, the community agency funding. The, um, that's, where it's, that's where it's always been. The uh, racial justice and equity, um, the dollars regarding the, um, the, the alliance, the implementation, that's likely going to be an HR because uh, most of those are HR implementation trainings and other things like that. Um, and that's what the, uh, the alliance folks have told us that's where that's going. And then the equity dollars from HR, from the basic human needs fund will be in, in uh, HRCS. And, well, so, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I, will my brother's keeper be in HRCS? Where did no, you say that was going to be? It's community agency. It's it's in essence like a general line in the budget, um, and I'm 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 almost positive it's always. Is that right, Jake? Is it? It's yeah. So agency, right? uh, my brother's keeper will be part of the uh, city supportive agencies. That's what it is. City. So it'll be in the non departmental section. Yep. That's where it's always been. And then, yeah. So the um, the point one percent for the basic human services increase uh, that'll be in the HRCS budget, and then the three hundred thousand for uh, the mayor's, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the acronym. The racial justice and equity report yes, uh, implementation. Uh, that'll be in HR. Uh, you should have that by uh, yeah. by the end of May. 
And I did ask um, about the Advanced Peace Initiative, the funding and where that's going to be. Yep, that will be in city supported agencies as well. So that's separate, that's in essence, non-departmental. And the, so that's, you that's know the, what the dollar amount is that we, has been allocated? We recommended the 240 that was asked for. Um, okay. So that's 240 that was asked for for the year. Um, now I'm not sure how they're gonna navigate. Our fiscal year doesn't match up with the county's fiscal year. Uh, our fiscal year starts in, in July and the county starts in January. So we have to wait for the county to pass theirs. And then we start that appropriation in 2022. So we have to navigate how those two connect um, if, if that's the amount that comes out of council. But we recommended the 240 for 2022. Um, and as you know, we, don't, we can't bind future councils. So that was, that was the option for this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Uh, Council Member Garza. Council Member, what is after that? Thank you, Council President. Good evening, everyone. Um, you know, I appreciate the, the executive summary there. Now, when we talk about you know needs and wants, um, I'm curious to know how much money is going to go into the art uh, and facade improvements. Uh, the same amount that were in the last budget uh, two years ago, and that we proposed last year. So the art, I believe, was one. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, 162, 500, and I think the facade was 175. Uh, does that sound right? Yeah, 167, 500, 175, yeah. Okay, 167, 500, 175. That was the amount that we passed two years ago, um, and it was what we proposed last year, and then it all got struck when we had to cut the 12 and a half million. Okay. Um, now, when you when you talked earlier about funding for L, LFD, the Lansing Fire Department, I see that the revenue share is 3.25 million. Um, is that included in the funding for the LFD or is there another uh, another amount that's gonna be going to the LFD other than their uh, percentage of the budget that was on that pie graph? Yeah, so the L, LFD gets uh, 1.5 million from the property tax uh, and then the um, 3.2 million is reimbursement from the state for their services. However, as far as uh, revenues go, that goes into the general pot of the general fund and gets swallowed up by their budget, which is uh, approaching 30 million or probably more than that. Let me pull it up. But it is uh, more than consumed by the general operations of the uh, department. Okay, and two, two last questions. Sorry, guys. Uh, the 4.7 million that's allocated for roads and parks. Do you have a certain amount of money that's going to go for the strictly for the roads and strictly for the parks? Yes. Uh, so let me pull up. My Keep mind, the park the parks millage goes only to the parks, um, but the parks millage is only a small part of our parks budget. Um, but that those dollars go for parks infrastructure and camps and things like that. So we've got the we've got the list uh, from the parks board. Um, so that's the kind of the CIP for the parks. And then we, we fund them out of our general fund budget. Um, and that's separate yeah. from our roads because our roads are funded from, from Public Act $51. Um, so they're each kind of segregated pots um, that are dedicated to those, those departments. Yeah, and if you look at your uh, budget book, you can uh, find those amounts on page 11. Uh, under property taxes, you'll find the non-dedicated portion 3.525 million for police, uh, 3.5, the same amount to fire, and then 2.35 million each to roads and parks. Okay, thank you. And, the, and the, my final question is that public service, the 311, is that gonna be uh, 24 seven, like, or is it gonna be the normal hours of public service? I would have to confirm that back to you. Yeah, we'd have to talk to Mumby. Chris Mumby is, is, is running that. Um, I don't think it's 24 hours. Um, I think it's, I think it's work day. It's just, you know, getting a human on the phone and putting those, those bodies in one place instead of having them separated out. But, um, Christopher Mumby's running that. So we can, we can have him answer that question through the committee process or, you know, one-on-one -on -one or however you want it. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Council member Garza, uh, council member Wood, then Dunbar. <laughs> Thank you, President Spadafort. Um, I appreciate the fact that you anticipated my question on the line item. I still am baffled and will be baffled every year uh, under the fact that I'm not sure how you put a budget together without having the line item first. Um, but, you know, I, I get that. Uh, I appreciate the fact that I can guarantee that I'll have that on Friday. 
Um, having said that, um, my next question has to do with the Peace um, Alliance um, portion that we're working with the county. Since it's going to HRCS, I'm assuming then that, or maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming we're going to enter into a contract with um, Ingham County and they will be um, the ones that will be um, doing the legwork on that. Am, am I correct? You're half correct. The uh, okay. advanced piece is it's one of our city supported agencies, so it's not going through HRCS, but we will okay. absolutely have a contract. Um, we will absolutely have a contract with the county um, to make sure that this is going on in the city of Lansing, especially. Uh, I love our neighbors, but um, this is going to be for the city. Um, so we'll have a contract. I, I, you know, I don't know. We'll have to navigate uh, if it's us, the county, and Advance Peace, or if it's us with the county and the county with Advance Peace. We'll have to navigate the legalities of that um, as we as we move forward. It was the county health department that um, that originally presented to both you and to me. And um, we'll have to navigate exactly how the contract works, but it will certainly be a contract um, okay. for the, the, the use of those dollars and making sure that they're used again where they're supposed to. We also want metrics. You know, they've they've talked to us about metrics in Stockton, California, and another city that I can't remember. And we want to make sure we're getting the same metrics to see what's working and what's not. Um, so all of that will be in the contract. Um, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. just for clarification, um, it, it's my understanding that the contract goes to the Michigan Public Health Institute. So just okay. to just to remember you. specifically. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, okay. Thank you. I'm Councilmember. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know Councilmember Spitzley and, and Dunbar and, and a few others have, have been involved as well. And, and uh, we're, we're interested in providing the funding and MPHI and the county and, uh, and advanced peace will all be part of it. There'll be a contract. Absolutely. And then um, looking at the budget, the budget that you have before us and the revenue dollars is based on the fact that you believe that the millage will pass um, this year for um, the fire, police, and um, public services. Am I correct on that? Yeah, we are. Um, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong. We did. We budgeted 19.44. Uh, if the millage were to not pass, council can still. Um, still assess up to 18.97, but yeah, we're, we're budgeting for it to pass. That's a good point. Okay. Um, right. Is that right, Jake? The 19.4 is, is, is budgeted? I believe our triples would hit the next fiscal year, not this uh, upcoming one. Oh, is it next? All right, Chris is, Chris Swope's nodding his head also. So that's next fiscal year. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a year ahead. We'll, we'll have that problem next year because okay. we can still collect through the end of December of this year before it expires. So we'll have collected okay. that anyway. Thank you. All right. And, and the millage before for police and fire went for personnel. It helped pay for um, the staffing of police and, and fire. Yeah. Correct. I think that's the same language that we sent you, right? Um, I think we sent you that language last week and it should okay. be the same language. It's in this packet for referral tonight. Is it? Okay. okay. Well, then you have it for referral tonight. Thank you. And then, um, it, and maybe Robert Jake can answer this. Um, have you had any conversations with the tax tribunal or with the assessor to determine um, what the potential is for people coming before the tax tribunal um, based on property taxes? Um, I see Rob shaking his head. So. Rob, you want to, I mean, Sharon was, was part of a lot yeah. of our, Sharon and, yeah. and, uh, and Desiree both were part of a lot of our budget conversations for both income tax and for appeals. Yeah, uh, the assessor has been very helpful in sharing any information with us um, as it comes in. So do you have an, even a projected number of what you feel that we, you know, have the the anticipation of of uh, filings. Sharon's got. We can have her discuss that. It, with you. Okay. Yeah. She's, yeah. We'll circle up with her. She's got. I'd say. I don't know that she would. She would predict. She doesn't want to lose her license. 
so I don't think she would predict. Council member Wood, I don't want to interrupt, but one thing I think we're going to do this year a little differently too is we're going to have a a, a, a session or a, a significant portion of a session dedicated to a revenue discussion in context of all of the changing revenue streams that we've got in front of us. Um, we had talked about doing it before the budget presentation, but with the American Rescue Plan coming, we had no idea what to say. It would, it would have been wrong the, the minute it was presented. Thank you. And my last question is, I thought we had had some discussion that we might be seeing um, as part of this budget proposal, just um, a look at what a five-year budget might look like is um, is I, I haven't gone page by page with this because we got it this afternoon. So could someone tell me whether that's in it or not? It's not. And, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And if not, do we think that we'll be getting something before we pass the budget? And, and again, I realize we can't hold those numbers. It's no different than if we had gotten one five years ago. We wouldn't have projected COVID. So, I mean, I, I get that, but I'm. It's not in there, Councilwoman. Um, we had, we had played around with a three-year budget to try and, but a lot of it was really guesswork. Um, I don't okay. want to, I don't want to provide something that's guesswork when we really don't know, maybe by May we'll have an idea, you know, if, if, uh, if the vaccinations are out and we're seeing people starting to come back, but even today we're hearing that the numbers are rising in Michigan. And so a lot of it is really guesswork. Um, I mean, we've got, we're not allocating all the dollars, as Rob mentioned, the slow burn. We're not allocating all the dollars from the federal government. Um, we are proposing holding a significant amount back. Um, and what Rob didn't mention is even um, we can't allocate them all because for the, the 51 million or whatever the number turns out to be, um, they'll, only they'll only provide us dollars based on losses. Um, so even when you talk about OPEB and things like that, OPEB went up. We didn't have a loss. Um, so we're only allowed to use the dollars for actual losses. So we lost in the parking system. We lost with LEPFA. We lost with income tax. We lost with fines and fees. And, um, and Jake has gone through and kind of tallied all of the loss. Um, so we'll have some of that left over and we know what we'll have and we can share that with you, certainly. But I think a lot of the, um, the income tax is guesswork because we don't know where COVID is going to stand. So um, if it if it makes sense to do a you know even a three year projection um, by the time you're passing the budget because things have stabilized one way or the other then um, I think that's that's doable but as things continue to to change week to week um, it's it's very challenging I, I really didn't want to put together a complete and wild guess um, we wanted to you know to we wanted to have an idea of where the numbers stood so um, we will continue to look at that over the next you know month or two. Um, we just we don't want to give an unrealistic number, but we can tell you the numbers that we that we'll have in terms of the federal dollars. Okay, and then my last question, I promise, um, has to do with the Teamsters. The Teamsters were the only bargaining group that settled for a zero contract, and um, with some of the things that we've seen, we just settled with fire. Um, are, are you having any discussions with the Teamsters or any thought about going back and, and having a discussion with them? Yes, um, we would very much like to reward them. They took a 0% for this year um, with the understanding that our budget was in bad shape with, uh, with our budget being a little bit better. Um, we are absolutely uh, going to be having conversations with the Teamsters um, to, to look at how we can reward them for this year, uh, and then we'll have to do another a contract moving forward. But in terms of this year with the 0%, we will certainly have conversations with them about how to reward them for, um, for really agreeing to take a hit, understanding the city's financial, um, financial situation. So yes. I, I appreciate that and I'm sure they will too. Thank you. <laughs> I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor, are you all set? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, I am. Thank you. The next uh, council member is council member Jackson. Council member Jackson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I have two questions right now. One is, and I, I might've missed it, but the American Rescue Plan, that's the federal government one. And I believe it is. And can you tell me how much money it is total? And I, I know you said a few different places it was going to, but also are there any restrictions or stipulations on the spending of that? So how much is it? Where is it going and are there any restrictions otherwise? It's approximate, it's estimated to be 51 million by the congressional staffers, but we're waiting for treasury to confirm that number. Um, it is 
uh, usable from 2020 through 2024 budgets. Um, so we can use it over basically the four years. Um, uh, it is, there are several restrictions. Um, the restrictions are that it has to be used for decreases in, in, um, in pots of money from, uh, from previous to current. So it's based on 2019. So anything that we compare it to has to be compared to 2019 and what the allocations were there. Um, it cannot be used for pensions. It cannot be used. It cannot be used for public pensions. It can be used for private multi-corporate pensions. Um, it can. Uh, it cannot be used for streets in terms of infrastructure, but it can be used for sewers and uh, one or two other uses. Um, broadband, I think. Um, yeah. And uh, that's mostly it. So um, we got money. Uh, all the different cities and townships and villages got money. The counties got money. Um, it was 1.9 trillion, and I want to say 350 billion of it was for local governments, uh, and the state got money. Um, that's kind of the summary of it. We have a we have an NLC uh, presentation that we can send to you if you'd like. That kind of goes through all of this. Uh, as Rob said, it's going to come in two batches, two tranches. They called it um, about half within 60 days, and originally we thought it was half uh, um, within three months. But now Rob is hearing that it's half. The other half will get in a year. Um, so uh, that's mostly it. Thank you. Um, so I guess just to follow up on that, is it possible to have just like somebody email me um, just about that? Um, we can send you the NLC I, know, I just want to look at that. Yep. We'll, we'll send you the okay. NLC PowerPoint. Rob, can you be sure to send all of council the NLC PowerPoint? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've got it. And I then the it. second, Go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the second question is, can similarly, can somebody send an email that just kind of outlines the increases to the police budget, just what the increase is and how much it is and what it's for um, from last year to this year? Yep. Just and so yeah. I can have it. I think the only increase we put in was a radio budget, was the radio equipment, but um... Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, there'll be increases for for healthcare expenses and things like that. They go up. Healthcare goes up every year for everybody. Um, but I think the only substantive increase we made was for the radio equipment. But Jake and Rob can send you that. Okay. I mean, I did hear a social worker, a FOIA officer. Oh, yep. You're right. Radio. I'm sorry. Nope. You're right. I was thinking personnel. You're right. Um, okay. the, the social Just worker. Just whatever it is. Yep. We can get you that. Thank you. I apologize for that. It was social worker, FOIA officer, radio equipment. Um, you're right. My apologies. So that's why I shouldn't, I, I should let the budget people do it. Sorry. <laughs> if, if someone could just send me an email, I appreciate it or send it to all of us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll Thank send you. it to all of council. I will note too for council members, uh, there is a, um, the, Andy, what's the organization that represents us? MML, the Michigan Municipal League, is um, doing a webinar on the American Rescue Plan too, and, and use is coming up pretty soon. I don't remember when it was, but we just got the email today or, or sometime this weekend, perhaps, um, if that interests any council members. I think it's a free webinar. I'll also remind you all that the, the FOIA officer, the FOIA officer and the social worker were both in your, in your budget priorities document that you sent to me. So both of those were um, things that we were able to do based on the council request. And I don't, want, I don't know if council member Jackson's finished, but I did want to thank everyone for the, for the FOIA officer as the person who arbitrates those appeals. I'm very happy to hear that workload is going to be um, lessened for some of those folks and we'll be able to do it more efficiently. Uh, council member Jackson, were you all set? I, I know you had your hand up still. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a couple questions too. Um, you pointed out about $135,000 increase to the HRC budget relative to that change in um, the ordinance allowing for more dollars dedicated specifically to racial justice and equity. Can you remind folks um, that are listening, paying attention, um, what the application process is? Because we did just change that. Is there someone here that can speak to that or? Uh, that would be a, a Kim Coleman question, but I okay. believe we had, uh, I think the applications for that um, closed in February. Um, they go, they put out a, a variety of information to groups all throughout the city, starting usually at the end of the year. They have a big budget uh, um, symposium. It used to be mandatory. Now it's highly recommended, but we don't make it mandatory anymore because it's during the day and a lot of the groups are doing their service work. Um, 
But uh, I know, Carol or Kathy, you've both been through this. Do you remember when the deadlines are? Are those deadlines statutory or policy? They originally were policy. I know when we sent you the ordinance, we may have, I don't remember if we included, we sent it a while ago. I don't remember if we included specifics or generalities, but we did put something in the recommendations. I'd have to go back and look. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar? Thank you. I would just say um, maybe before we consider the allocations for how that's spent, that we do some community outreach to find out how people want it spent. I'm not saying what particular organizations we would fund, but to find out what activities are most needed so that we're prepared when the applications come in uh, to make sure that we're addressing needs identified by the community. And I'll, I'll point out that work, a lot of that work happened. Um, the HRCS board does that specifically, and they put together a five or six point um, or a, a fairly comprehensive list of, of needs. And then when people apply, they, they tell you where they are within those needs, that needs, di uh, that needs list. Um, so they've done a lot of that work. They do that at the end of the year in anticipation for applications to be coming in. I believe in January, maybe potentially February is the deadline. So a lot of that is done in advance. Um, and they'll be done again when you pass this budget. Again, that work will happen with our staff and our HRCS folks. And it sounds like Councilwoman Wood is agreeing with me that it's February deadline. So that will happen throughout the, throughout the year in anticipation of the next application process with these dollars that we put in. Um, so that will be coming. And I think having Kim Coleman in uh, or Katrina uh, or um, Tony to discuss that process would be probably give you many more specifics. Mr. Mayor, I would make one request if, if legally possible um, to see if we might be able to open the window a little bit to allow folks to apply for the newly allocated funds. Certainly I'm, if I'm mistaken and forgot that we did put a tight timeline in the ordinance, that's, that's a different set of circumstances. But if there is some flexibility, I would encourage it particularly on the new 135,000. Mark, you're watching. Will you please talk to Kim Coleman and, and talk to her about that and see if that's possible to open it up for, I mean, it's, it would be specifically equity. This would be um, equity usage funding. Yeah. Um, so Mark, you're, you're on. If you'll talk to Kim about that and then get back with council. Thank you. That would be great. That'd be great. Thank you. Councilmember Dunbar, did you have anything to add? Your hand's still up. Okay. Councilmember Dunbar. I do, especially if we're going to open it up. I thought at one point, um, I heard you say, Mr. Mayor, that it was for the calendar year of 22 that the equity funding had been. So I wanted to make sure, one, that it was for the fiscal year starting now in July. And because of that, um, and especially if we're going to open it up for funding opportunities, because the window for participation from community members in the February roundtables, which determines um, or informs the priorities, um, I would suggest that we have another round of community engagement um, because I don't know that the HRCS board sitting right now would be prepared and, and, and I don't think they should speak on behalf of the community looking for um, these funds. We'll have to navigate this because we're in essence at the, um, this is, it's a July one, the money starts coming in July one as part of the, the new budget. Um, but you passed the ordinance in March, so we'll have to navigate the intricacies there. When I said calendar year, I was talking about advanced peace. Advanced peace starts with the 2022 calendar year because that's when the county's uh, budget starts. Um, so that was not uh, what I referenced with the calendar year. Um, with this budget, it starts July 1, um, and but we're going to have to navigate um, we're going to have to navigate that process because again, we passed a new ordinance in the middle of the well, I'd say at the, at the um, about the three quarter point for the year. So we've got three months left in this fiscal year and then we've got next year and we've got the process. I don't know, I'd have to, we have to talk to Kim Coleman and see what their process is and if it's that's something that staff can, can actually get done. Well, thank you, Councilmember Dower, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Wood. Um, just to add some clarity to this, on uh, January 27th was the HRCS roundtable um, that invited um, all the, uh, a number of different community um, groups to come and present, uh, which was done in a Zoom forum. And then February 10th was when all applications were due 
um, back to HRCS. It's my understanding, you know, that that goes through a review process um, with Kim, the board, and then is passed on um, to the mayor. And then we receive from council's perspective, uh, the list that um, they recommend to us at the budget time. So um, whether, again, some of those groups were invited or not, you'd have to get the list um, from, from Kim um, that, that's there. And it's been my experience that there are a multitude of groups that um, are involved in this and not all of them get funding. So the fact that there's additional funding they might be able to utilize and, and get some of the needs that are that the community believes are out there. Agreed. Thank you, Councilmember Wood. Looks like that exhausts our questions. I'm sure we'll have many, many more once we get the line items and through the next couple months of budgeting process. But thank you for presenting this. Um, thank you for recognizing some of the priorities that we put in. Uh, yes. I, um, Kim Coleman texted me and said she's on the call and she said, yes, we will reach out to the community with hopes of dispersing funds for the upcoming year. So they will do, they will do some reach out. Great. So, um, she's on top of it. She's, thank hi you. Kim. Hi Kim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Whittigan, uh, Mr. Brower for your time tonight. Uh, we're gonna move on to um, the rest of our agenda. Comments by council members. Um, is there anyone, I've got some things to say, but I'll let y'all go first. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you. I just want to um, announce that tomorrow, um, first of all, I wanna back up. I want to um, salute the Ingham County Health Department and the, the COVID vaccination rollout. Um, I got my first uh, shot last week on the 14th, I think at the pavilion. And uh, I'm gonna tell you that that thing was seamless. Um, they had um, they had Michigan State Police, they had National Guard, they had you know Lansing paramedics, um, and they got you in and got you out. It was very seamless, and so I want to throw a shout out to the Ingham County Health Department um, and a thank you for that. Um, what they've done um, is they have, in order to try to reach. Um, the critical um, populations, they've done a number of um, pop-up clinics. And the last one um, is tomorrow, March 23rd. Um, there's, a, there's a COVID vaccination pop-up location at the Union Missionary Baptist Church. Um, it's my understanding that there is approximately um, 100 more opportunities um, for vaccinations for folks who are um, 60 and above or 50 and above with certain medical conditions who live in Ingham County and in um, particular zip codes, which are um, 48910, 489110, um, 489112, 489133, 48906, 48915, or Lansing Township 48917. Um, and so that, that's another opportunity um, for folks who may not have transportation to go out to the pavilion to avail themselves um, of a COVID vaccination. Um, if you want to schedule an appointment, uh, please contact Mindy Smith at 517-243-5134. And again, hats off to the Ingham County Health Department for um, just for a seamless um, experience at the MSU Pavilion. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Just wanna make a regular announcement for anybody that wants to subscribe to the fourth quarter newsletter. It's just a way to communicate uh, with some council updates, some feedback. I've had a few people, um, well, many people reply back with their comments and I would like to share the updates with you. So if you would like to have them, please email me at Brian T. Jackson at LansingMI.gov, and I'll be sure to add you to the list. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wood. Thank you, President Spadafore. I very rarely um, talk about my other job, but today I wanted to announce we have three volunteers 
Um, one is a foster grandparent and two are senior companions. All three of them are 95 years old and volunteering. And I just wanted to put a shout out to Dorothy Rush, who is a foster grandparent, Helen Simons, who is a senior companion, which means she goes into senior um, living facilities, nursing home facilities, and works with the, uh, those patients that are there. And Fran Woodring, who is another one that goes in um, to senior facilities. Now, of course, all three of these um, young ladies have not been able um, to serve lately, but all of them are very anxious to get back. Um, to serving and have um, served our community for a number of years. But to have all three of them turning 95 and all three of them anxious to be out there back out uh, giving of their time and talents to others is just fantastic. So I wanted to recognize these three, uh, their birthdays and uh, let everyone know how much we appreciate them. Thank you, Council Member Wood. Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. I, I just got permission to be able to speak about this tonight. I, um, I, I wanted to address this and, and Mr. Mayor, this is to you and, and also to Chief Green. There, was, there were a couple of different incidences that I became aware of through Facebook that happened recently. And one of them was a, um, a chase that happened with a suspected gunman in South Lansing where the officer drove through residential backyards trying to, um, to get, to, to do whatever. Um, nobody knew, the residents didn't know at the time what was going on. Um, a gentleman posted a picture of this police car outside of his back window. And he said his daughters came to him and said, daddy, there's the police out here. And he tried to make communication with the police officer. The officer had driven across several backyards to get to his where he sat for a while. And then he backed up and went between houses and out to a main road across the front yard. And he said that basically when he tried to communicate with the officer, even out on the front porch, the guy looked at him and then and just took off and never came back. And, and he was, this guy was generous in, in, in how he reported this on Facebook. He said, I understand there might've been, you know, an emergency situation, but also if there is an emergency situation, and as it turned out, it was a suspected shooter. If there was engaged gunfire, the backdrop to the police car was this family's home. So, and I'm not trying to make this a big public thing. I just, I, I, I need there to be some accountability here and I'm not going to name the officers, um, but I did, I did email Chief Green and I shared with him the concerns. And I got a nice email back that said he would send an officer out there to take the complaint. What I got from the gentleman, um, what I heard from the gentleman after the officer had been there was that he didn't write anything down. He verbally, he heard the complaint. Um, he explained that it was a young officer and he had made a bad decision. Um, but he also said that it would be handled internally and that his complaint was not actually taken. And uh, this, it concerns me on a couple of different levels because one, we can't have accountability to know how it's going to be handled if there isn't a complaint to track. I'm not trying to get that young officer in trouble. I want him to have better training in this. Um, I imagine it was a very scary situation for him to be in, in, in a situation where there was a suspected shooter on the run and they thought it was somewhere in this vicinity. I'm not sure, I, I'm sure it was not the right decision to drive across these residential backyards where kids play and to cut between houses and to never go back and discuss this situation with the families who obviously saw him. So the Lieutenant went to the house and, um, and listened to the concerns and said that it would be addressed internally. And, and again, I, I, I would like some way to follow up on what is discussed in this and how, I, I think when you handle things internally, when there is a matter of public trust involved, we're not following up with the public to let them know that it's been handled in a, in a way that they can have confidence it won't happen again. And so for me, I would like to maybe look at how when these situations happen, and it's not a public shaming thing, but that a complaint was made and that this is how it was addressed in the same way that we do like City Connect. 
and we say there's a pothole here and there's a checkup on it so that somehow the public knows that that this has been addressed and that if other people see it happening in the future they'll know hey we we've addressed this once so now it's not a matter of not knowing it's now people not following procedure and they should know the procedure and I've asked the chief, how would you have handled this situation differently? And, and what will you tell that officer would have been a better way to handle it? Um, and so I'm waiting to hear that reply. And I appreciate the dialogue that we're having, but I also think it's a bigger conversation to have with the community involved in the situation because it was so prominent on Facebook and there were so many concerns raised. Another one of the concerns raised, um, which I've also shared with the chief, in the engagement where the officer came to speak with the gentleman about what had happened. There were several times in the conversation where he kept putting his hand on his gun. And and, and actually we used the term, there's this, he said, when you train somebody in a paramilitary way, you respond in a paramilitary way. And I'm, you know, we can all use different words for, for that, but when, there's a there's a fearful response and, and, a, and this this sort of habitual reaching for the gun, which it honestly scared the daughters. They didn't want to open the door when they saw it was the police officer standing there with his hand on his gun, and and the father noted several times. And so that to me is that's a general rapport thing. Like we should be maybe working on how to have these difficult conversations without using body language that is subliminally threatening. Um, I mean, I'm sure that he didn't actively think about the fact that he was putting his hand on his gun, but it, it happened and, and it had an effect. And the final thing I'm mentioning is another incident which I have yet to be able to talk to Chief Green about, which is another thing that, you know, when these things happen, if we don't address them and they're all over the social media world, everybody's got the opportunity to make their own mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know, fill in the gaps with, with their own mm -hmm. thought process. Mm -hmm. There was a woman involved in an accident and, and when she got out of her car um, and was waiting for the police to arrive, she accused, she, she, she saw the man who had been involved in the accident with her get out and start acting aggressively toward her so she became she began filming him and um, there is an allegation of an assault that occurred where this man hit the phone out of her hand and it hit her in the face and she tried to address the assault portion of this unsuccessfully several times and finally an officer went to her house to address this and while he was at the door he did what I never want to see a police officer do, which is make excuses that this man might have been having a bad day. Did he really did she really want to, to put this on his record? He had a baby in the car. No, no. When this woman is five foot two and the guy assaulting her is like over six foot four, this this woman deserved to have her complaint taken seriously and to have it dismissed and the guy didn't take her, he didn't, and she's trying to get her, her stuff back. She said she provided a bunch of evidence, including the videotape for them to file this complaint against um, this gentleman, um, gentleman that was involved in the accident. And the case was closed because that officer that went to her door never turned any of that stuff in. Now, I know that there's two sides to every story and I'm waiting very patiently to hear the rest of this, but both of those incidences just reinforce to me the need that we have to really work on how our officers interact with empathy, understanding, and um, compassion when they're dealing with the community and not make excuses for bad behavior. Okay, um, thank you, Council Member Dunbar. Council Member uh, Spitzley has a response, I believe. Yeah, um, Mr. Mayor, I, um, it, it's Kathy, I'm glad you brought that up. My mother called me um, and it was her backyard where they started the chase. And when she called me and she said, there's a police officer, you know, driving through my backyard. I, I really thought she was playing around. I, I actually didn't believe her at first. And so, you know, she's been talking to her neighbors as well. Um, <clears throat> so that was, you know, I 
he had to hop a curb to get into their backyard. He must have came up Moffat and then my parents own the vacant piece of property by the woods. So he had to hop that curve to drive through there and drive through um, the neighbors, um, the backyards. Um, I did immediately uh, reach out to Chief Green um, and ask him, you know, basically what the heck was going on. And, um, and, 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 you know, my mother had a different experience from the officers um, who, who came to her house, but I think that the concern is still valid about, um, I, I just find that shocking. <laughs> and, um, but, um, there was a complaint taken. So I'm, 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 a, I apologize that a complaint wasn't taken and maybe, you know, that he didn't take a complaint from the, the gentleman that you're speaking about, Kathy, because he had already taken one from somewhere else. Cause I know that they were going down the street, but that, that was, that was pretty surprising. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize that that was, that was a thing that you could drive in people's private property like that. I don't believe it is a thing. So I just want to, I don't think it should have been a thing. Thank you, council members. Um, I will leave that to the mayor to respond if he wants to during mayor's comments. Um, so the thing I just want to add is not that thing. Um, it's a different thing um, about virtual meetings. Uh, we talked in the community of the whole um, a long time ago, around five o'clock, no, nope, 530, excuse me, that we were the, the plan forward is going to be starting April 12th. Some, uh, and just reiterating for the council, but I think there's a, a different audience tonight than, than was at COW. Uh, April 12th, we will allow for participation of council members and the public, both in person and virtually, uh, with very limited uh, ability to allow people into chambers. Um, I did mention that we talked to City TV and others about possibly moving out to the South Washington office complex but because of the, um, that room is not set up to broadcast on a regular basis. So it would require several staff members and lots of equipment that we might ha not have or have to bring in and tear down and set up every time because that, that room is used for other things that the chambers makes the most sense for right now. Um, we'll have to look at, we had my OSHA in to do some help with, with distancing and spacing. Um, and then we will have an overflow for 25 people with televisions in the council, uh, city hall lobby. Um, and then we'll have, we're gonna work on logistics. Uh, Sherry's already emailed me scheduling a time to go do a, do a, a practice run with City TV and others. Um, and then we will um, we'll do that, but we'll still have the hybrid option. So council members that are participating remotely will still participate remotely and public that want to call in rather than come downtown will certainly be willing to do that or be able to do that, excuse me. So that's the plan starting April 12th. Um, we did talk about committee meetings as well because the governor's um, or uh, the MIOSHA orders about workplace rules still have not yet been lifted to allow for city hall to open completely. Um, we are not gonna plan that yet because uh, while we can open city hall for a full city council meeting, it becomes more cumbersome to do it for on a one-off for committees. So um, we're gonna just, we're gonna stick to virtual committee meetings for right now and then um, hybrid cow and council. Um, we have double checked our X's and, um, and crossed our T's and dotted our I's with the city attorney's office to make sure we're in compliance with the laws. And again, uh, just reiterating that no council member should feel compelled or mandated to be in person if they don't want to be downtown. Um, we will we'll, we'll work as best we can to make this a good experience for those at home and those in the room um, and those traveling wherever. So we will we'll get that done. So thank you for that indulgence. Um, I think that's it. We're going to move on to the city clerk. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. A couple of announcements that I do want to make. A reminder for those folks who live in the Holt or Waverly School District, uh, you do have a special election coming up in May. You should have gotten an absentee ballot application uh, at home in the mail. Um, and for those who have already requested your ballot, we will uh, be mailing those later this week. So watch out for that ballot. Um, and again, the election day is uh, May 4th. Um, if you recall, we opened quite a number of drop boxes last year. Um, because of the small number of people involved in this election, we are limiting which ones we have open uh, to the ones that are uh, at our main locations, as well as uh, the ones uh, that are um, 
address the folks who live in those school districts within the city of Lansing. I also want to um, tack on to what Council Member Spitzley said about the uh, COVID-19 vaccination clinic over at the um, MSU Pavilion. I've actually um, spent a number of afternoons volunteering at that clinic to help uh, get the vaccinations administered. I'm one of the people that watches the cars and uh, uh, monitors the folks for 15 minutes. Uh, it is a great, uh, great experience. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that did concern me as I was volunteering there um, was that it did not seem uh, as racially diverse as our community, uh, the cars that I saw coming through the line. And so I'm, I'm glad that the health department is, uh, is working to expand uh, access uh, to more, uh, more accessible locations. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, I, Councilmember Wood mentioned volunteers. Uh, we also use some volunteers in my office. And in fact, uh, a couple of them, uh, we were featured on the Good Neighbors segment on Fox 47. Uh, so I want to, um, just a couple of the many volunteers that we have were, were featured. Um, so Judith Lindsay and um, Cheryl Funderbunk Stevens uh, were, were both featured. So I encourage you to go and look at that. We did. Uh, put a link to the uh, to the video on our Facebook page, um, but uh, you know we have people who volunteer for us, and they treat it as a social gathering. And um, they've been doing many of them have been doing it for many years, and we really appreciate all of the work that they that they provide to us. And with that, um, we are to community event announcements. Um, so I see a couple of people have their hands up. I, at this point, we are only doing hands up for community event announcements. So if that's not what you want, please take your hand down. Uh, we will give you about a minute to um, tell us the details, uh, time, place, um, and purpose of your event. We'll give you about a minute. And it looks like we have uh, the advocates followed by Berlisha Kelly and then Erica Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes, no, yep. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I wanna state that um, the advocates along with the Village Lansing, Black Lives Matter Lansing and Mikey 23 Foundation has been doing 2A21 where we are getting all uh, newly aged 21 year olds that turn 21 in the year 2021 licensed with their CPL so they can no longer have to get pulled over for carrying legal weapons and not be and, and go to jail for a CCW. Uh, so we're trying to stall that prison or excuse me school to prison pipeline by uh, education and, and licensing them so that's that uh, secondly saturday april 10th at 2 p.m we're having a community conversation with candidates on safety and policing and given the outrage uh, from our council member at large kathy dunbar and at large Patricia spitzley on the uh, police car driving in the backyard we love to have you all who are up for election this year come to that conversation so that we can have conversation around the actual outraged issues of police brutality and people dying in jails and so on and so forth. Cause those are the things we should be really upset about and talking on council. So outside of that, Saturday, April 10th at 2 PM, Black Lives Matter Lansing is inviting all candidates to that community conversation. Uh, it will be a conversation again with the community, uh, not a, um, a group of people we put together but real actual people that will have concerns and comments and have questions for you all and, uh, and have a conversation surrounding safety and policing. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, again, if anybody wants to sign up their youngster for the CPL class, it's at the-advocates.net. Uh, if they wanted to donate to this program, you can go to the villagelansing.org uh, to give, it does cost about $200 per student to get them fully licensed. Um, and if anybody has any questions about why we're doing this or why this is important, please feel free to reach out to myself or Erica uh, to give you more information on this, but it's definitely needed. People don't use firearms illegally when they're legal to own them and understand uh, the safety and surrounding uh, about that. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Felicia Kelly and then Erica Lee. Felicia, uh, you can unmute yourself. You have a Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my hand was initially up for the rezoning, so I will go ahead okay, and- Just put it back up in about one minute. 
Yes. Uh, um, okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Erica? Thank you. Um, the Village Lansing will be holding our second annual Lansing School District Open House Celebration. Um, that is to celebrate the hard work of the class of 2021 graduates uh, from Lansing Everett, Sexton, and Eastern. Um, the tentative date is June 6, 2021. The time and location is to be determined. Um, and that date is tentative. We are aiming to coincide with the uh, drive through commencement ceremony like we did last year. That way we can stagger the three schools out. Um, if you would like to donate to the efforts, please visit thevillagelansing.org um, or visit us on Facebook. If you would like to be a sponsor or support in any other way, um, there are a lot of different ways. We wanna make this a celebration. If you were able to attend last year, um, we had snacks, food, entertainment. We did a youth march for justice. Um, that was sponsored by the Fledge. So different ways that you can sponsor, different ways that you can support. Um, if you're interested in something like that, you can uh, reach us at thevillagelansing at gmail, um, or you can call us at 517-483-2233. Um, but we are holding that second annual open house celebration for the Lansing School District grads. So please, um, we wanna make this a great one. If you can support in any way, give us a call, shoot us an email, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, now you, if you want to speak on legislative matters, please uh, begin raising your hand, uh, raise hand on the, uh, press Alt-Y on a Windows computer or Option-Y on an Apple or star nine on a phone. Um, so we will uh, continue to uh, recognize the raised hands. Uh, so you'll have through uh, the mayor's comments as well as through at, at least the very first speaker, but we will cut it off uh, after the first speaker or shortly after that. Um, so please begin raising your hands and the items eligible for discussion under public comment. Uh, we don't have any public hearings, but we have ordinances for passage, uh, the items on the consent agenda, the resolutions for action, and the uh, ordinances for introduction of which I think we have the most I've ever seen in a single meeting to be introduced. Um, but please uh, raise your hand. And with that, we are to the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. Um, I will add my voice to those who would like to congratulate the Ingham County Health Department. Uh, I was able to volunteer at the vaccination clinic at Dwight Rich here in Lansing. Uh, it was a great experience uh, helping people to make sure the forms got filled out right, to make sure their cards were right, um, kind of watching them as, as, uh, as they waited. Um, there was a, I haven't, I haven't been to the one um, at the pavilion since they first opened. There was a good diverse cross-section of folks at, at Dwight Rich, so um, that's good news. And again, that's right in the heart of 48910, 48911, which are, to, are our Lansing's two highest COVID populations. So uh, kudos to the school district and the health department for partnering. Uh, kudos to our emergency management staff here in Lansing for helping to set that up and insisting that we need to do something here in Lansing. Um, really a great effort between the three entities. And um, it's, if anyone who's vaccinated uh, volunteer there, it really was incredible. Um, I want to remind everybody who's watching, uh, Lansing has pushed back. We have, I have pushed back our income tax deadline to June 1st. The federal government pushed it back to mid-May. Um, so we are always about 15 days behind the federal government. So uh, if, you, if you haven't filed your income taxes, you have until June 1st. Uh, if you're ready with them, file them now, please. We want to get all the collections in and we want to make for sure refunds um, are provided in a timely manner as, as necessary but um, the income tax deadline has been pushed back to June 1st. Um, for those interested in, in helping out the city, uh, March 27th, uh, there'll be a cleanup in the Baker neighborhood. Uh, um, so that should be a, a great event to, to clean up. Um, we're hearing a lot of, of folks around the city who are concerned about um, uh, roads and highways that, that have trash and, and our neighborhoods department will provide you know, resources, bags and things like that for cleanups. I know. Uh, Councilman Hussein does one on Edgewood every year, um, and uh, we've got a variety of others who, who want to do that. So we're providing those resources, but there'll be a March 27th one at Baker, I believe, with Coggle. Um, there'll be a golf at the stadium event on April 7th at 4.30. I am not a golfer, but 
but I hear it's going to be a lot of fun. It's actual golf at the stadium. Um, so for you golfers, get a tee time, I guess. Um, we released our LEDC annual report, incredible work going on with our economic development uh, arm, uh, $1.5 billion in investment in Lansing just, just last year, um, ongoing and completed. And, and uh, I hope you'll take a look at that report. I know we sent that to council, so it's probably going to be referred to be put on file, but I hope you'll all take a look. Um, yard waste. Uh, April 19th, our pickup starts. I know it's beautiful out and I know people are putting stuff in yards, wait, yard waste bags already, but please don't put them to the curb yet. Um, please, uh, if, you, if you have yard waste bags and you wanna drop them off, um, you can drop them off at our uh, 601 East South Street, our operations and maintenance building. Uh, every Saturday, you can drop them off until April 19th. There's, only, there's a 10 bag limit, um, but you can drop them off every Saturday till April 19th and on April 19th, we start picking up again. Um, this year, we're expecting to have our seasonals on and our staffing, so we don't expect there to be a delay like there was last year. I'm still apologizing for that, but uh, um, please everybody remember as it's you know 70 degrees today, um, please remember that we don't start picking up till April 19th, and if you have to get it dropped off, uh, it's 601 East South Street. It's the City of Lansing Operations and Maintenance Building on Saturdays. Um, and then finally, uh, our arts grants were issued for last year, our second round of arts grants. Um, so congratulations to the uh, Capital City Film Festival, Lansing Symphony Orchestra, the Michigan Institute for Contemporary Arts, which we lovingly call MICA, uh, Pass It On Community Center and Peppermint Creek, all of who received uh, arts grants from the city of Lansing, doing incredible work, keeping our city vibrant, making sure that, that we are uh, an exciting uh, and fun place, showing pride in our city. Uh, all these are very important entities and it's being and we're helping to make their work possible through our arts grants. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. So oh, I, uh, I forgot. I, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention uh, Councilman Dunbar's uh, issues. Um, honestly, it's the first I'm hearing of it. Um, so um, I invite anyone to please send that stuff my way. But I was not aware of either the car in the backyard or the other incident. But I wrote them both down. And I will have conversations with the chief tomorrow. Um, I know a lot of that is provided to, to internal affairs for investigation, but if you're saying that they weren't or they were some reason, um, you know, especially an officer saying, you know, trying to discourage someone um, from filing a report, we have, uh, we have cited, we have cited people for, for things like that in the past. You want to make sure that everyone has the ability to, to provide reports. So I'll talk to the chief about that, but um, please send those to me. Uh, you can call me, you can email me, um, and I'll, I'll take those up with the chief, um, but I know he is um, very interested in, in ensuring accountability and ensuring that people can, can make complaints and, and have them investigated and, and, uh, you know, and, we, and we take action. So um, I will certainly talk to the chief about that uh, for Councilman Dunbar and, and Spitzley. Um, I did not realize your mother was involved. I, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, we'll make sure that, I'll make sure that I talk to the chief about that and that all of these are taken very seriously. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. I, I really would like to thank you for saying that, uh, Mayor. But I really would like to look at possibly some type of a system where we can um, we can share with the public how these are addressed, as opposed to just internally. And I'm not saying that the officer names have to be attached to them, but in the same way, folks can track a complaint on City Connect. I would like them to be able to, to, to track a complaint in, in the I know we do, we do have our, our, um, our PD app, which is very similar to Lansing Connect, except it's, it's for police. Um, but I'll, I, I, I hear you. And um, I, I, think that, I think you can track a lot of that, but let's find out. We've got a police transparency page. So um, let, me, let me do some work on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Mr. Clark. Okay, thank you. So we are to public comment on legislative matters. And again, that is limited to the items that council will be acting on tonight. Uh, ordinances for passage, consent agenda, resolutions for action, and ordinances for introduction and the first speaker. And we will be um, stopping the sign up uh, after the first speaker. Um, again, Alt-Y on uh, Windows, Option-Y on Apple, raise your hand icon uh, if you have it somewhere, or star nine on a good old-fashioned phone. 
The first speaker is Loretta Stanaway, followed by Zach Lee. Hello again. Um, briefly and somewhat quickly, I suppose, uh, I do support the special land use for um, the Sparrow addresses for St. Casimir to become uh, ref ref refurbished and uh, refocus their efforts and what they handle. I think that's all a very good project and I 100% support it. On, um, excuse me, on the advanced uh, piece thing, I think that on the whole, that is something I would like to support, but I don't feel like I've had enough opportunity and I don't know that the public as a whole has had enough opportunity to hear enough about it and have time to look into it enough to come up with questions and, and any concerns there might be specifically about um, tracking their success and whether or not they've had the success that they uh, present having had and how it's financed. Um, I wish there was more time to dig into that before you folks were gonna vote on it. It might very well be something I would end up supporting, but at this point, I just don't know. And then on the list of different ordinances to be uh, rescinded, I'll say on the one hand, I think this is a good effort because at least you're not just having an ordinance on the book that you're not enforcing uh, but on the other hand, there are several of these that I would not like to see off of the books. I would not like to see any of them off of the books with the exception of number 10, uh, which I think it's just really difficult to prove how someone is annoying to another person. Um, in particular, I wouldn't want to see the uh, play in the streets removed because I know how many people already walk in the streets and rollerblade in the streets and and uh, play basketball on the streets. And I think that's just looking for an accident to happen. Also, I particularly wouldn't want to see the um, loaning money to students removed because I think that was initially established to prevent students from extorting one another. And I think that that could be a problem again if that were removed. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Next is Zach Whaley, followed by the advocates. Uh, Michael. Thanks, Mr. Swope. Um, Loretta Lynn, to respond to your comments on that, just I think the question would come into play as to whether we feel that the most effective way to respond to people who are playing in the streets or loaning petty cash between each other at an elementary school is to find them through the criminal penal system. Um, I don't think that's probably the best way to handle those situations. So maybe just consider that um, from a different lens than you currently are. Um, I look forward to the accountability on the police officers involved in the uh, incidents this week. Um, this is related to the budget in terms of police. Um, when those uh, come through, just make sure that they don't mention like the police uh, chief's phone number because um, that'll definitely get you fired. So um, Councilperson Jackson, um, you mentioned wanting to know a little bit more about the increases in the LPD um, funding for next year. Um, and I've had the budget for a couple hours, so I was able to figure most of that out. Um, there was the JAG grant, which went to um, IT and upgraded cameras, which is about 250K. And then the other 1 million was to increase the budget for active personnel. Now I know we have the increase in budget due to the um, social worker along with the additional FOIA person. Um, if we're paying them both half a million dollars, then like, let me know when those job uh, posts hop up because that seems pretty, uh, like a sweet gig. Um, I mean, social workers should get paid that much, but um, beyond that, the other stuff was just increases to fixed costs for uh, retirement and stuff like that. But in terms of the uh, so-called budget transparency, um, it, there was a complete reworking of the way that the budget was published this year versus years prior, where um, there was an inclusion of a sub uh, category that never previously existed called internal service and fund expense, uh, expenses. Um, funds were real allocated through this to try to lump a bunch of like other things that were previously between different departments. And uh, while we can call that budget transparency, I think it would be naive to think that that had nothing to do with the fact that previously people were able to campaign against police funding by talking about how a third of the uh, city's budget went towards police. And now if you look at it, it's like, oh no, it's like 11%, it's nothing. I mean, it's on that beautiful pie chart that everybody's gonna look at. We only put 11% or uh, sorry, 17, uh, percent of the police department. The thing is, is if you actually scroll down to page like 58, 
and you look at the total $50 million budget and you divide that by the actual total city budget, it actually comes out to 33.16%, which is actually about a, a 300 basis point increase over last year. So despite everybody's call to decrease funding for the police, we increased funding for the police. We buried it in a 127 page long doc, 134 page long document to make it look like we didn't increase the funding for the police. And then we threw like $400,000 at uh, HRCS, uh, which, was, which was great. So um, before we start claiming credit for uh, defunding or uh, reallocating those funds, I just want to make sure that we name that, that that did uh, occur. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mike Lynn again. Um, I have some of the very similar uh, concerns. Um, can you all hear me? Good, okay. Yes. Uh, so the things that Brian T. Jackson, Councilman Jackson brought forward, I appreciate uh, again, Loretta and, and concerns of kids gonna start extorting money again because this is off the books. It's just, it's just that paranoia. We gotta work on that. <laughs> um, kids playing in the streets. You know, you want kids to stop shooting and stop beating up people and fighting. And this is what we constantly do is take away from kids, right? Can't even play in the streets anymore. Guys, we gotta think outside our little white boxes. All right, secondly, this budget, um, I think uh, Zach touched on most of it very good. Uh, I think that um, one thing that I keep hearing that I'm very concerned with is this racial equity and justice. And the fact that the mayor just stated that, that this, this alliance that he put together of hodgepodge people that are uh, just no more qualified than the fact that they're elitist in some form or fashion or work some job that he feels very comfortable stating in a, in a public nature. What I, I thought I, thought, I could have sworn I heard you say there was some um, a massive amount of money that they're going to decide where it goes when my racial justice equity firm tells me or people tell me where this is going to go. We're going to decide where this goes. I just don't understand. Like, what's the qualifications and how is this not coming through committee or through uh, the council and council? Why are y'all allowing it? Secondly, um, I'm tired of hearing the word justice. Who are you giving justice to? Where is the justice going to? The only people who have been harmed can't talk and you won't speak to us. You're not trying to do anything for that other than fight the things in court. I'm not, I'm, I'm just confused as where the justice is going out to. There is no justice that's been had. There's no racial equity. I'm, I'm glad you learned that, that word too, again, equity, because on the BLM uh, call to action, you didn't know what it meant. So that's a good word for you. We usually, people usually learn words like that in kindergarten or maybe third grade. Uh, outside of that, this, this, this budget, again, like Zach said, you're hiding the police budget. Um, all of the transparency that you guys speak on, every time you try to sell us on something, I have to, it's like almost like exactly the opposite of what you're trying to sell us on, the transparency of it all. And secondly, uh, this $50 million has been talked, to, talked about a lot. Um, I know that this administration believes that we all black people don't speak to each other, but I know of at least three pastors who have been contacted in the last week and told the money's in, can we have that conversation now? Andy, that's illegal. You can't do that in election year. You cannot use this money given to you uh, by, by the federal government to buy votes or buy people's silence. It's illegal. And Chris Swope, I'd like you to look into that. FOIA his phone. Isn't your phone a, a public record? FOIA his phone and find out the people that's calling or your campaign manager and who they're calling. These things are illegal. So that budget we definitely need to be contact or find, figuring out and paying attention. And thank you, Brian T. Jackson, for asking that question. He wants a breakdown of where it's going, how it's allocated, and so on. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, next, I've got uh, Doug Rubley, followed by Mike Redding. Everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'd like to speak to the mayor's budget tonight. Uh, my name is Doug Rubley, uh, finance director of 31 years for the city of Lansing, which which I'm very proud. Uh, I really didn't hear a lot today with the details. Uh, I, and I've been a part of the budget for 31 years or was, and I know how you all try to please current year activities, which really is what you're supposed to be doing to a certain extent. So I have no problem with that. The mayor did address legacy costs to an extent, but what is not addressed in these budget, I don't know if this is a sand wedge or a driver. Are we falling behind? Are we getting ahead? Do we have an actual evaluation? Do we know what we should be contributing to healthcare? I really think we should look hard at this. And I know if we're getting extra federal money, it's a shell game. 
And you know, you can talk to your finance director or your budget director. You can't put it toward retirement legacy costs, but you could put it toward roads and take roads money and put it toward healthcare. I mean, there's a lot of ways to solve this issue. I, I just don't want us to forget that the easiest thing going forward is to reduce your long-term liability and do what you gotta do to get current things done. I agree with that. And it, if the mayor's putting money toward the legacy costs, are we getting ahead or are we getting behind? I don't know, he didn't say, I'm not criticizing, but we really need to focus on that. And I just don't wanna lose track of that because budget hearings in the most part get sidetracked between $100,000 items and $50,000 items when we're talking hundreds of million dollar items. So please take that into consideration. Please look at that when you proceed to this year's budget items. And I, you know, when, when, you, when you look at it, we don't even have an actual evaluation of how much we should be putting into healthcare. That would be a great start. So that we really knew, I'm not faulting the mayor on this one. Don't get me wrong. I haven't agreed with you in the past, but you know, we're in a situation where how much should we be putting in? And he may be putting a lot more in, but those are the things that are gonna drag us down in the future. I just don't want us to forget we need to do this because you've done some great labor negotiations. So your legacy costs are gonna go down in the future. And it's the 75 plus year olds that are dragging you down. I understand that. We just need to help that and resolve that, make it part of the, part of the budget process. God bless you, Carol Woods, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Redding, followed by Erica Lynn. Good evening. I'll make this uh, quick. I'm calling in response to the 3534, 3538 West Jolly um, idea of rezoning that so they can add another nine unit apartment in the back. Um, I speak it as myself and also as the president of Churchill Downs. I sent you guys a letter with some photos. I'm going to kind of touch on that stuff so you understand. Um, the property itself, uh, the piece of property that's on the east side of those two, built up their parking lot when they built it in. It is five feet above the, eight, the adjacent property. So the water that is there has nowhere to go except in the neighbor's backyards. A perfect example is if you looked at those pictures, you'll see a, a spot in the fence where the shed, you can see through it. And that all that underneath that fence is where the water's rolling and it's created its own path. We know water goes least resistance. It happens to be least resistance into these neighbor's backyards. Okay, so when it rains, their backyard is unusable. And we're not talking about just the day after. We're talking about weeks after because the water is nowhere to go. The drain doesn't work there because it's elevated a little bit higher than the backyards because the houses in this neighborhood, they have one drain for three houses on each side. And it appears that there may be more draining into the one that's in the back of Marsh's yard. Um, also, you'll notice in the pictures that this area that they have not done anything with has become a, a hangout for trash. Uh, the trees have been cut down and then um, logged up and not anything done with them. It's all overgrown. Um, and they're using it for a place to dump trash. It just looks nasty. And I am uh, hoping that you guys will not allow this to be rezoned uh, because our neighbors bought those houses not with the idea that they were going to have to deal with um, an apartment complex on the other side. They bought it for a place for their family and to hopefully get a little bit of money out of their purchase. You guys put another apartment in there, their value is going to go down because now they have to deal either deal with or don't deal with a water problem that is destroying sheds, concrete pads, and one neighbor said they're getting leakage into their house because there's so much water in the backyard. So unless these people that are putting in this apartment complex want to spend a million dollars and put a, a, an efficient drain in, I'm not, I hope you don't vote for this. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next is Erica Lynn, followed by Rochelle Franklin. 
Thank you. Um, I would like to start off just quickly by saying I do support the St. Casimir Church Initiative. I think it is a great idea and I hope it's a wonderful addition to the community. Um, I am also in support of all of the um, repeals of the ordinances that were originally brought by Council Member Jackson. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction of decriminalizing being black, brown, and or poor. Um, so that's a great start there. Um, I also am in support of the Advanced Peace Initiative at its core. The program itself is a wonderful one, um, but I have to say the concern comes in per usual as how that program is actually implemented. Um, I have some serious questions about what it means for the, you know, it, not necessarily so much as the county. The county does tend to take kind of a hands-off approach to things, but um, I do have some serious concerns with what the city putting forth money means. What exactly does that mean for this program? The reason that this program at its core is successful is that it does not partnership with police, okay? It is not something that is led by or anything like that. It is very much separate and not affiliated with the police and that is why it is successful. It is also community-based and community-led. So the question will be, are you all going to allow that to be truly community-based and you know, community-led? That would be, you know, my question, my concern. Um, On to the budget. Wow. So that's a tough one because, you know, the saying the devils in the details is so true because <laughs> I agree with Council Member Wood. I do not understand why the line items come after. That is a tactic that is so counterproductive to transparency. It's inexplicable. And when we're talking about obscene amounts of money that you can just umbrella under racial equity, under your racial equity alliance that you appointed that are literally aligned to you, Mayor Propagandy. Like, how can we not be concerned about that? So excuse me, if I'm very concerned about how any of the funds are allocated to that arena are used, especially if you can't give any details. It literally feels like being on a presentation with a kid in a group project that doesn't really know all of the details and you're just kind of giving us fluff because it sounds good. That's what it feels like. And then the federal funds. I honestly expect to see a clearly defined, fair, equitable, very transparent outlined process to the public on that. How can we have money like that? Millions of millions of dollars. The public should know exactly how those funds are going to be dispersed, how the public, the community orgs get their hands on those. And we need to know definitively without a doubt that they're being used appropriately, fairly and equitably. And they're gonna actually move the city forward, not be used in phone calls to say, hey, we've got some money. Can we play ball now? That is unacceptable. What is this smart? Thank you. Uh, next we've got Rochelle Franklin by Kyle. Hi, um, this is Rochelle Franklin. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, just wanted to speak on the ordinances um, that um, are up for repeal. Uh, five of eight of them I oppose. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but my main concern is I have questions. What's the plan to control crime and protect our residents if we repeal these um, ordinances? I'm, I'm a proponent of change. I have no problem with change, but I feel it should be changed for the better, the betterment of our residents and not just for a few, but for the majority. So where is this coming from? Um, and I just want to know how are we going to, what are we going to do to control crime or possible crime? It's, it's been stated that these ordinances are hardly ever enforced anyway, but I'd like to see some movement behind um, safety and, and, and control. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kai. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Clerk Swope, because I know I may have fallen off the list. I might a little bit of internet glitch over here. Um, but, uh, I wanted to talk about the ordinances. Uh, I think that, like the, I guess the questions that came to mind for me when I was looking at them was who wrote the laws and when, who do they benefit? And in practice, who will these laws be used against? And I think when you look at this list of ordinances, you know, we've got playing in the street, 
right? We've got annoying persons. You can't tell me that like an old rich white guy didn't didn't write that law, right? Who, 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 annoying persons, what? Come on, bikes, bikes in the park, right? When there's a scheduled event, how am I supposed to know if there's a scheduled event if I'm riding my bike, right? I'm riding my bike to the park. Oh, now there's a scheduled event, so now I can't ride to the park because I wasn't invited to the scheduled event, right? Like it doesn't, these, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, and so I really, I agree with, you know, getting rid of, getting rid of them, cleaning house a little bit. Um, Mayor Shore, your budget presentation, I don't know. It, 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 it did feel like there wasn't a lot of substance because, you know, you came for your budget presentation without your line items. Um, and, and I feel like if we wanted to talk about a budget, it would be really nice to look at the line items when we're having that presentation. Um, and it was, it was just kind of weird because you like, you were talking about COVID and you were like, you know, I don't want to, you know, present something that's, you know, just guesswork. I don't want to present something that's just guesswork. And then you thought, you know, you flash some flashy pie charts for your budget. Like, did you, are you done? Is it, is like, are you, is this a week late? Like, I don't, I get that COVID's going on and everybody's kind of trying to get through their own time, but like, it's a budget, man. Line items. That Friday is probably a little bit like a week too late, in all honesty. So that's all I got for legislative items. All right, thank you. That was our last speaker that signed up before we close the sign up. Uh, so we are to, um, Oh, I do want to acknowledge that we do have a couple letters uh, in opposition to the rezoning that will be made part of our uh, permanent record. Um, and that takes us to our rezoning uh, Z9. Of 2020, we have an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan, providing for the rezoning of a parcel of real property located in the city of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1246.02 of the code of ordinances. This is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the committee on development and planning and is on the order of immediate passage. Council member Spitzley to the order. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, what Chris, what um, Mr. Swope said, but um, this was um, passed unanimously, excuse me, passed unanimously out of the planning um, commission. Um, we had discussions about it in development and planning and there were some concerns. Um, I, will, I will admit there were some concerns. It's um, this rezoning from CUP community unit plan to DM1 residential district. The CUP community unit plan is really an obsolete zoning designation. Um, but the plan is to, at some point, um, uh, redevelop um, into uh, an apartment unit from those, in those two areas. Um, I think there was some concern regarding um, the condition of the current structures there and the ownership there. And, um, you know, basically, are we, are we, um, rewarding bad behavior by um, approving this uh, change in zoning. Um, so, you know, we, we brought it forth and um, had a public hearing on it, um, but I just wanted everyone to know that there were some concerns. Um, for me personally, I'm just gonna say, I, I, I cannot support this, um, this zoning change, um, but as chair, I do have to bring it forth and, um, and bring it forth the ordinance for passage. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. We have a few hands on the subject. First is our Vice President, Mr. Council Member Singh. Sure, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to address this. Uh, yeah, so I was also, you know, obviously I'm part of the DMP uh, committee and we vetted this. Um, and just to add a little bit more uh, context, um, with regard to, you know, when we're talking about a rezone, you always have to look at obviously surrounding zoning, surrounding land use, and the master plan. I mean, you just absolutely have to. Um, and when you look at, um, you know, both to the north, the south, I think also to the west, you have low density residential. Uh, you do have to the, uh, to the east, you do have um, the DM1. Uh, and I think that's, you know, the argument uh, that was made in front of the planning board. Um, but even when you take a look at the master plan, the master plan calls for 
low density residential. So as we tra you know, transition over to form based code, um, that continues to be, uh, or we continue to call for uh, in this new code, uh, low density residential. Um, so when you look at zoning, um, anywhere from probably A to C, probably the A to C designations, um, you know, would make sense in terms of current zoning. Um, anything in the D, um, when you're talking about um, moderate to higher end uh, density, um, is, is inappropriate, in my opinion, for this area. We did talk to our zoning administrator, and she admitted that she could have came down on either uh, side of the fence on this thing, um, although she did recommend uh, approval. Um, she said that she also uh, could see why um, this body would, would vote it down, um, and, and she would not be necessarily uncomfortable um, with this body voting it down. Um, and then I think you have to take into consideration uh, the, the voices of the Churchill uh, Downs community uh, that have come out really in droves, both through the committee and uh, you know, the committee process, as well as uh, the public hearings uh, process, as well as tonight's process. Um, they have concerns. I think their uh, concerns are warranted. Um, and I think we should certainly um, uh, heed the advice of that community. So and with that being said, I will also be um, not supporting this. Thank you, Council Member uh, Hussein. Uh, next up, Council Member Wood, followed by Council Member Betts. Thank you, President Spadafore. Um, this particular area has been a problem for a number of years. As, as Council Member Hussein knows, the number of meetings that we've been to at Churchill Downs, and especially when there has been rain and things like that, we frequently hear um, the issues about the flooding. Um, and uh, I totally agree with Council Member Hussein on the density issue uh, that this uh, particular rezoning uh, could come into effect and have a, a dramatic effect on that neighborhood. So first of all, I, I won't be supporting uh, this rezone. But what I'd also like is I'd like um, to ask that um, the mayor working with um, Andy Kilpatrick and with uh, the city attorney look at the drain um, situation. And the reason I say the city attorney with this is there's actually an ordinance on the books that talks about um, water drainage into other people's property and that uh, the flow of that. And so there is, there is an ordinance on the books that prohibits that. Um, so if we could uh, reach out, you know, rezoning it stops the additional build, but it doesn't take care of the problem, which is the drainage that is affecting this neighborhood. So I think um, the, there has to be a two-pronged approach with this, and I would ask, again, that... Um, uh, the mayor having Andy Kilpatrick work with the city attorney to try to come up with a remedy to that and then get back with this body to let us know what that that remedy um, is. Um, I, I would appreciate that. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wood, Councilmember Betts. Thank you, President Spadafore. I think the only other comment that I have, I think that uh, Vice President Hussein made a good comment about this not matching the master plan. Um, the only other argument that we haven't really addressed is that CUP is uh, an obsolete zoning code. And uh, one of the arguments that the zoning administrator made was that, well, we need to get rid of these obsolete zoning codes. However, uh, I, I believe that it was confirmed to committee, I was just looking over the minutes on this, that um, under form-based code, CUP, th this, this particular uh, uh, piece, this particular parcel would be included in low uh, low density residential anyway. So it's not, this body doesn't necessarily need to take this out of the CUP designation for it then to be designated low density. So um, I will not be supporting this as well uh, for that reason. Thank you. It's me, isn't it? Um, that is, I see no further hands. So Councilmember Spitzley, I do not recall if you made the motion. I believe you did. Yes, there's a motion by Councilmember Spitzley. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? On adoption of Z9 of 2020, Councilmember Spitzley. No. Councilmember Spitzley. No. Councilmember Wood. No. Councilmember Betts. No. Councilmember Dunbar. No. Councilmember Garza. No. 
Council Member Hussein. No. Council Member Jackson. No. Eight yeas, or zero yeas, eight nays. The ordinance is not adopted. And that takes us to the um, consent agenda. Yes, Mr. Clerk, uh, just for the council's record, we will have one item on the consent agenda. It'll be the Department of Transportation Local Bridge Program grant, ap grant application. We have to remove the extension of the declaration of state of emergency. There's an amendment that's needed on that. Mr. Vice President. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Did you remove, remove number yes, three? Yes, I, I removed the uh, emergency or, uh, extension. Okay. Thank you so much. So the consent agenda then only includes a grant application for the Michigan Department of Transportation Local Bridge Program. Uh, bridge program. Um, I think that's the shortest motion I've ever had to make under the consent agenda. So I appreciate uh, appreciate it very much. And that being said, I would move uh, the consent agenda. Very good, Mr. Cook. Please call the roll. On the consent agenda of one, Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The item is adopted. Uh, so now we are to the uh, extend the declaration of this emergency. Yes, uh, and the only change here is that we're moving it from um, April 14th to the 28th. Um, that would be uh, in the last paragraph. Let me pull it up here for you in writing. Um, it's April 28th, right there. So that would be the change is um, extending that to the next meeting. Uh, we're, we're moving this task back to the mayor's office for them to determine based on the information that's in front of them when to move that. So we're relying on their office to refer us with those. So I, rather than proving it today and then having them come to us next week and say, I got to refer another one because it's so soon, we gave them an uh, extra two weeks on that in case things change after the Myosha rules change or whatnot, but that'll give us a little extra time on that. So that's the only change there, it continues the extension of the state of emergency. So. Mr. Vice President, um, I, I would hand the gavel over to you and move the, the resolution. All right, so there is a, a motion on the floor for the discussion. Seeing none, Clerk Swope, so please take the roll. On the resolution to extend the declaration, Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Member Garza. Yes. Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. That is adopted. That takes us to SLU 5 of 2020. All right. Spadafore, yep. You have the gavel. Got it back. All right. Thank you. Um, that one is Council Member Spitzley. Tonight is Patricia's night. Coming up, Patricia, tonight. All right. Yeah, Council Member right. Spitzley. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. So what we have before us is a special land use permit for 727 Sparrow Avenue, which used to be St. Casimir's Church, um, to allow for the um, construction or rehab into a community center outreach facility and a transitional housing shelter um, in the A residential district. Um, what we've been told is that um, the entire footprint, of course, will be used but that there will be um, uh, there will be opportunity for community activities um, in the center as well. Um, I don't know what else to say about it other than to move the resolution for action. Um, if any of the other council members want to um, expand on that, that's fine. But at this point, I'll just move the resolution. Councilmember uh, Jackson. Thank you. I'll just add that I've heard only support from people on this. Uh, not even one single person, uh, even privately, told me that they don't support this. And I know it'll also headquarter and again allow extra space and including the um, youth 
temporary and more long-term homeless shelter, which I think is going to be very important. So I'll definitely be supporting this. And I can speak for the most part out of everybody I heard, even from that neighborhood, they supported as well. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Uh, Councilmember Delmar, would you like to, oh, you have your hand up, sorry. I was gonna, would you like to address, I know there was a question two weeks ago about whether some of the activities that go on there will continue under new, under new ownership. So if you'd like to address that, please. And then whatever you were gonna raise your hand about. <laughs> you're muted, Kathy. Kathy, you're muted. <laughs> Sounded, ex it looked exciting. I know I started talking with my hands, but I need them to hold down my space bar. Um, so I'm actually sitting in the principal's office at St. Kaz as we speak. And, um, and I can tell you that um, I closely monitor the Morris Park Facebook page. I have been in um, contact with Julie Thomasma, the director at Child and Family Charities. And we've been, um, we've had tours in here of their board and community members and the synergy here is amazing. I know that there were concerns I did not get to address last week. So thank you for bringing that up. Folks were saying that, you know, the gym had been open for voting in the past. And I believe they are open to continuing that into the future, um, keeping this a polling place. They want the, the facilities to be open when they can be for community use. Uh, there will obviously be a lot of programs and um, uh, taking up space in here, but, but the gym and the kitchen and um, the farmer's market will stay. Um, I, I don't know if the soup kitchen that was here has left and found a new home, but that doesn't mean that we aren't going to partner to try to start a new uh, meal program here when COVID is uh, over so that we can serve both the community neighbors around here and um, the families that are served by a child and family. They're supportive of the pantry that's outside. Um, they're just, they're wonderful partners. And I just, I've, I've not heard one well, actually, in the beginning, there were some a little, few concerns, but Julie did such a good job reaching out to the community to allay those fears, um, and they're just wonderful partners, and they've been around here for over 100 years, and St. Casmer turned 100 years old, um, so their mission and the diocese mission for what would be done here is, is they match, they align wonderfully, so I just I wanted to say I support this wholeheartedly. And then my second reason for raising my hand is, I don't know if I can actually vote on this. If, and I don't know, like I'm gonna be a tenant in the building where they're gonna be. So do I need to recuse myself on this vote? We'll ask the city attorney. So yes, you said the magic word, you've raised the issue of conflict. So under the charter, there has to be a vote about whether or not you ha uh, can vote on this and you're not entitled to vote. Um, and it'll be a five vote item uh, for a conflict. So uh, there should be uh, uh, a motion to, ex uh, to, to excuse you from voting and you can't vote on it and it's a five vote item. Is there a motion to recuse Kath, uh, excuse Council Member Dunbar from voting on item five? I would move the recusal. It's been I've got to carry this for me. What's that? I said, y'all got to carry this for me. <laughs> I would I would advise if you're recusing, you should probably stop lobbying at this point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a motion before us. Um, I don't know if uh, we need any discussion, but uh, we'll we'll take a vote now if there's no discussion. Mr. Clerk. Hey, on the recusal, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. No. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Six days, one day, uh, the recusal is approved. All right. So the next item is voting on the actual resolution that Councilmember Spitzley moved. Um, any further discussion? I'm Seeing none, Mr. Clark, would you please call the roll? Okay, Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley.
I can't. Yes, I, yes. I carry trouble <laughs> unmuting myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted. And that takes us to the uh, advanced peace partnership. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a substitute. I have a substitute as well. So I need to move the substitute. Okay, let me get that over. Um, okay, the substitute has been moved. Um, let me find the, I don't have the draft in front of me. Jerry, do you, can you provide the draft please? And share it. Oh, here we go. She sent it to me. She's very okay. fast. Okay. Um, so let me put the sub up here for you real quick. And I'll just kind of tell you what the two differences are. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So um, <clears throat> the first difference is in light of what the mayor um, shared with us earlier today was to um, there's a couple things. There's a the, there's a whereas um, originally it said whereas the city of Lansing will support one hundred and seventy thousand dollars over three years um, through a uh, email from the city attorney and I should have caught it but I didn't. Um, city councils can't bind future city councils and so we needed to just um, you know focus on the current year. Um, we originally had 170,000 in there, but um, I specifically asked the mayor what um, he had planned on appropriating and he said 240,000 and so we changed that. So that's one of the changes. The second change is um, the, the be it resolved. Um, and, and the be it resolved uh, reflects uh, the funding commitment is contingent upon the agreement of other local units of government located within Ingham County to share the cost. And that's just basically, you know, um, recognizing and acknowledging that this is a regional effort um, and that, um, you know, other, other um, there will be other organizations also providing um, funding. Um, so with that, um, before I move the resolution, I, I did want to um, respond to one of the comments about um, uh, council member Spitzley, if we could uh, move this up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. We need thank to you. move the substitute. Please. Thank you. thank you. And with that, I'll move the substitute. Thank you. Substitute has been moved. Uh, Mr. Kirk, would you please call her on the um, adoption of this uh, council member Wood? Do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. And, and this speaks to the substitute. So what we're being asked to do is to pass a resolution committing us to um, budget dollars that we've not had a budget discussion on yet. Is, is that what I understand? That would be correct. I mean, in, in, in a nutshell, that would be correct. Um, initially, the dollar amount was, you know, $170,000, which had been mentioned last summer um, as part of um, some discussions. And so I was going to put that in there, but hearing the mayor's um, Hearing the comment from the mayor, um, I changed it to 240000 So, yes. Mr. City Attorney, I guess my question is, you know, the fact that we're pulling something out of the budget to vote on now, um, I, I just, I'm not saying that I don't support it. I'm just looking at, you know, the process that we have. We were given... We we appropriate we do not appropriate we approve appropriations. Mm -hmm. We just received the budget. So is this something? I, I I just have some questions on on the process that we're in. And Jim, before you before you um before you respond, Jim, really quick. I mean, the what we're approving really is support of the resolution. Um, and, and support of the advanced peace initiative. I mean, I, I included the dollar amount because I wanted to be clear that we, you know, we needed to appropriate or support it by way of dollars. And so, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I, I, you know, the resolution is, is, is for, you know, so they can receive other grant dollars, but I wanted to be accurate in the, in the amount of dollars that, that the city of Lansing 
or the city council were willing to provide in support. So, so city attorney, please, please help me first, out here. Uh, first of all, uh, the resolution I have has 170,000. Is that, has that been changed to two? We just the moved sub, the we substitute. Just, yeah, I did. We're, we're speaking to the sub right now, Jim. I have a substitute that says 170. That's why I okay. asked the question. Um, and it's in the whereas clause. Mm -hmm. The rest of the resolution, I mean, if it were to be appropriated, I would say it's a six vote item. It's really not covered by the charter under supplemental appropriations because you'd be appropriating in advance when you're doing the budget, um, but it doesn't appropriate. It's just yeah. really a statement of intent at this point. Okay. That, that's so, the clarification that I, yeah. that I needed. So let's just say, and, and I'm just using, you know, this far-fetched, you know, May we have a disaster on our hands and we're not able to appropriate that. We are not bound by this resolution um, where we put the fact that we have the intent of moving the $240,000. Is, is that what I'm hearing from you? This is, not, this is an intent. It is not an appropriation. All right. If and, that clause were in the resolve clause, I would say something different, but it is okay. All right. I just want I just want to be sure on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wood, for that clarification, Mr. City Attorney, Councilmember Spitzley. Uh, can Councilmember Dunbar. We're still um adopting the sub yet. We haven't yeah, we're still on the substitute. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I was just gonna say that I I think the emo the the important part of this is not necessarily where the money comes from. We were trying to be responsible and identify a source of funds so that it couldn't be refused, you know, on the basis that we have a budget crunch and there's nowhere for the money to come from. So like when we do budget priorities, this to us is a budget mm -hmm. priority that this be included. It's just an interesting timing that the, that this resolution isn't coming up until the day that the budget's already proposed because it would have been to encourage the mayor to do this, um, mm -hmm. but he proactively did it. Um, so what we're dealing with now is that many of the other foundations and municipalities that are waiting to enact their portions of this are looking to the city to see that we've allocated the funds mm -hmm. and we're moving forward. Um, so this is also serving as um, kind of proof uh, for them to that, that we are going to participate so that they can move forward with their funding mechanisms as well. Thank you. Uh, I see council member, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, council member Wood, your hand is still up. Yes, I just want to clarify. Kathy said that we're allocating and, and I no. just heard Jim say, no, we weren't allocating. We're not, um, we're okay. not. All we're right, not. just so Thank that- you. I'll correct my word. We're saying that we should do this. Okay. I just yeah. don't want to. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Clerk, on adoption of the sub. Okay. On the substitute, Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafort. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Eight yeah, yeah, zero nays. The substitute is adopted. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Would you like to move the resolution? I would. Um, and before I move the resolution, I would like to thank my colleagues on the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for co-sponsoring this resolution for me. So thank you, Council Member Jackson and Council Member Dunbar. Um, one of the questions that we did ask um, that were asked during public comment was the involvement of the city of Lansing and there was some concern about that. It is my understanding that the Michigan Public Health Institute will be um, the holder of this program and, and, and that, that was done by design um, to kind of make it, you know, as, as we talk about kind of a separate entity from the local government, the police department, the county. And so um, I hope that addresses the concern. Um, I, I did want to thank a few people before I move the resolution because I think it's important. Um, you know, we, we, we started this discussion last summer 
um, um, in, with uh, Jessica Yorko in the Ingham County Health Department. And we had um, a meeting, um, a kind of, um, they uh, expended dollars to have um, Mr. Bogan uh, come to the city of Lansing and, and um, the village, um, Mike and Erica Lynn, and I'd like to thank them. They hosted the meeting at the village um, where Mr. Bogan kind of gave an overview of the Advanced Peace Initiative. And so folks, I'd like to thank <clears throat> excuse me, from Ingham County, of course, is Jessica Yorko, but also Linda Vale, um, also Renald Jean Lewis. I'm sorry if I um, messed up your name. Um, Mr. Darren Southworth from the Ingham County Jail, um, Carol Siemens and Scott Hughes from the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office. Um, again, Paul Elam from the Michigan Public Health Institute, Darrell Slaughter from the Ingham County Board of Commissioners. Um, it was passed unanimously out of his Ingham County Board of Law Courts Committee and then unanimously passed from the Finance Committee. Um, I would also um, like to thank um, Fonda Brewer from Delta Township and then the East Lansing folks as well. Um, John Edmonds, Rena Risper, and Mike McKissick. Um, also um, Chief Green and Captain um, Bacchus. They were also involved this summer um, Adam Hussein, of course, um, but it was it was an effort to you know get educated, bring him in, um, have him meet with various groups um, to explain the Advanced Peace Initiative. Um, you know, one of the striking um, uh, one of the striking statistics is it costs about a million dollars um, when there's a homicide in the community, um, and so it, this is one of those things where. Um, I think even though the mayor has mentioned that he's going to fund it in his budget, it is, it is important for the resolution to pass to show support for Advanced Peace and the work that has been done up to this point um, and to um, show that council is in supportive. And you know, we also talked about it earlier this year in our budget priorities and how Advanced Peace was um, important. And when we had our budget priorities and our diversity, equity and inclusion committee earlier this year. And so, um, this is something that we, we can't, we cannot afford not to fund. I, that double negative always gets me, but it is an important thing. It's important for our community to address gun violence. And so I am pleased to move this resolution for um, passage. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Uh, we have two hands up for discussion. Council Member Dunbar followed by Council Member Betts. Thank you very much. I, um, I want to echo uh, what Council Member Spitzley was saying um, regarding the cost of gun violence in our community. Um, that it's, it's not, I mean, I attacked this from a fiscal perspective when I wrote about this because that's usually the argument that communities make is that we don't have the money. And so I framed the argument about how can we how can we be spending so much money right now investigating what is a record number of shootings in Lansing last year, um, record number of gun related homicides and gun related injuries, and the amount of governmental um, resources that go into that at all levels from response and emergency care and courts and prosecution and investigations and victims um, services and incarceration and all these things. And I really wanna point out as well that it's not just a fiscal issue because every life lost is invaluable. Mm -hmm. the, the social impact of gun violence goes far beyond whatever we can quantify in numbers of dollars. And the amount of money that, that, that we spend, and, and the estimates are conservative. They say a million dollars for every gun-related homicide, that's with one suspect. Mm -hmm. And I think it's $475,000 for a shooting. There are communities in the country where those costs are upward of 2 million and over a million um, respectively, just depending on the, the cost of things where they are. And so, you know, it is, it is incumbent on us as we re-envision and I really do collectively hope that all of us are on board with re-envisioning how we address crime um, and how we address 
social services and equity in the community because there is no there it's all tied together if you don't spend it on the front end you're going to spend three times as much on the back end and and we are trying to flip the dolphin here to get the money that's paid on the on the back end moved up front so that we can provide job training and programming and um, all kinds of things that can get people on a path where the inequities aren't fueling gun violence and other violence. So I, I am very glad that we're moving forward with this. And I also wanna say, because somebody did mention during comment um, about police and Yes, I've heard that Chief Green supports this program, which I'm very happy for, but they're not going to work with him. They do not work with the police department. They, they are very, very um, careful. They work with people who have been offenders before. They build trust in the community with people who are, um, are probably offenders that have not gotten into the system yet to kind of uh, combat gun violence before it happens. Um, but they are not sharing names. They are not collaborating. They are not, in order to build trust with the people who need to be at the center of this program, um, they, they work independently and they are not working with police. So I, I just need to make that very clear. And that's exactly why MPHI is doing the study and why UC Berkeley did the studies out in California for Sacramento and Richmond and Scranton. Was it Scranton? I don't remember. Maybe that's New York. I'm probably mis misstating another S name. But anyway, um, we will have results, um, but they will not be calculated by the city of Lansing. They will be calculated independently. That's my rant. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Betts. Thank you, President Spadford. I fully intend on supporting this as well for all the reasons mentioned above. Uh, one technical question for Jim. It looks like under the therefore be it resolved um, that we're resolving that Ingham County does something. Are we able to do that in a resolution? Uh, that's that's my only question. Mr. City Attorney, you are um, on mute. And this resolution, uh, Councilman Betts, does not really appropriate any money at this point. It's an expression of intent. And one of the uh, in the diocese of intent is that there be other units of government that will join in here. So there will be a contract at some point uh, where all of this is taken care of. So that's why that's in there. It's not a problem. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Council Member Spitzley made the motion. There's a proper motion before us, approval of the resolution. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? You gotta unmute yourself though first. I mean, it's only been a year. It's contagious. <laughs> Listen, we're all we're all in this together. We're all in this together. <clears throat> okay. Uh, on the resolution, Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Member Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Member Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted. And that takes us to ordinances for introduction. Hang on one second. We have uh, Councilmember Spitzley introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to repeal Chapter 630, Section 630.14, Criminal Misdemeanor under the General Offenses Code of the Codified Ordinances to eliminate loitering in places where prostitution or solicitation for lewd conduct occurs. The ordinance is read right a first time by its title and re refer to the Committee on Equity, Diverse, Diversity, and Inclusion. Councilor Spitzley, would you like to thank make you, a Mr. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to just again thank the council for approving the Advanced Peace Initiative. I'm I'm proud and thank so thank you for that. The second thing is these are not my ordinances. Um, these are Councilman Jackson's. He put these forth. They were brought to the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and um, there were a number of them. Um, and there are some that are tabled. We tabled um, six, 
seven, eight, nine. We tabled at least 10 for further discussion. Um, these, the ordinances that are up here for introduction and setting of the public hearing were discussed. Um, the chief of police was part of the discussion. The courts were part of the discussion um, and the city attorney were part of the discussion. Most of these um, ordinances that are up for um, uh, repeal um, were either ordinances where there is another a mechanism on the books to, um, to enforce something like that, or they were unconstitutional, or they were just obsolete. And so I wanna um, allow uh, Councilmember Jackson the, um, the, 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 the pleasure of introducing these ordinances to set the public hearing and, and thank them for his hard work on this, Councilmember Jackson. Thank That's you okay. for that. Um, so I'll briefly touch these because Councilwoman Spitzley kind of summed up the justification for the ones we see today. And basically these are the ones that passed out of committee without much um, opposition. And Chief Green was a part of these conversations. And I can go, I don't know, uh, Mr. President, if you want me to go one by one or just move them all, but basically, to summarize, Chief Green um, agreed that the L LPD does not have an interest in enforcing these and practically they don't enforce them for the fact that they looked at their records and were able to uh, ascertain that, for example, last year there were no prosecutions. Um, I think for all of these that are listed today, there's pretty much and correct me if I'm wrong for the people who were there, but there was pretty much little or no prosecutorial action taken. Um, it does, we don't know necessarily how many people were investigated for any of these things, but as far as the records in district court, we had Anethea Brewer, she's um, court administrator in our Lansing court. We had our city attorney and the assistant city attorneys who prosecute these. And for the most part, there were no objections to them. So um, 630.14, loitering in places where prostitution or solicitation for a lewd conduct occurs or has occurred. Um, if you actually look at the rest of the, the ordinance here, it, it says a public place is any street, sidewalk, alley, park, building, vehicle, any of these things. And the thing that was interesting, it says occurs or occurred which means in the past, if it's happened, you can't be in that area. Um, this sounds more criminal than it actually is. I would submit that each of these ordinances, the act itself is not a matter of public safety and really shouldn't be a crime worth jail and fines and probation. Each one of these, if you take the actual conduct, it doesn't put anybody in jeopardy um, and it's not something that I think as a community, we think, oh, that's so bad. So with that first one, loitering in a place is not engaging in prostitution or encouraging it or attempting to, it's being in a place where it once happened or has happened. So that in itself isn't public safety and there was no objection to get rid of it. So it voted out of committee 3-0. The next one, 650-04, playing in the street, um, Council Member Jackson, um, I'm getting told if we could do one at a time with a vote and all that, that would be that would be ideal so we can get them done. I appreciate that there's a package here, but we have to set the, the hearings on them. Um, sure. I, I appreciate move, the explanation. I would move 630.14 for a public hearing. Thank you very much. There's a motion on 630.14 uh, for a public hearing, and, and the date on that is? April 12th. April 12th. Thank you very much. Any discussion, Councilmember Wood? Thank you, and this would go for all of them based on Councilmember Spitzley's um, comments that some of these had um, other ordinances out there that did the same or were similar in effect. Um, if before the public hearing, the city attorney could provide uh, the council with those, I would appreciate it. Instead of me asking that for each one of these, I, I'm doing it in a group and if he could provide those um, if there are 
um, other ordinances out there that reflect these uh, or other statutes that can be utilized instead. I would appreciate that. Jim? It's not just that there are other laws, Council Member uh, Wood. It may be that the language is now unconstitutional. Uh, so there could be other reasons why the ordinance if you could provide us that, yes. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. There's been a motion by Councilmember Jackson to set the public hearing on 63.14 for April 12th. Mr. Kirk, please call the roll. Um, setting the public hearing, Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Member Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The public hearing is set. Uh, next, we have uh, Councilmember Jackson introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, um, <clears throat> to repeal Chapter Six Fifty, Section Six Fifty Point Zero Four a criminal misdemeanor under the General Offenses Code of the Codified Ordinances to eliminate plain in the streets. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Council Member Jackson. Thank you. Um, plain in the streets is also covered by City Ordinance 658.04, Obstruction of Public Ways. Um, I would move this for a public hearing. Playing in the streets does not sound like something that we want to have on our books as a criminal offense. Maybe it could go to civil infraction, but at the same time, there are other ordinances that would stop anybody from uh, impeding traffic or slowing traffic up in the streets that is not playing in the streets. It's the other one, obstruction of public right-of-ways or pub public um, ways. So. By eliminating this ordinance, it will not give free reign for kids to play basketball and not move out of the street because there's another one that would require them to move out of the street. So I would move for a public hearing for April 12th. Thank you. There is a motion on the table and I see no discussion. So Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Um, I'm setting the hearing, Council Member Spisley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Uh, eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution to set the hearing is adopted. And that takes us to the next one. Uh, Councilmember Jackson introduced um, an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to repeal chapter 656, section 50, 656.04, a criminal misdemeanor under the general offenses code of the codified ordinances to eliminate prohibition of bicycles on riverfront park during an organized event. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. You're, you're right. Um, so this one is outdated. It's from 1987, where Adato Park was called Riverfront Park, and the festivals listed here that you can't ride your bike in are no longer part of city events, including the Ethnic Festival, the River Fest, North Lansing Fun Fest, Black Cultural Festival, and Mexican Festival. I may be wrong, but I don't think those are any a part of the city's schedule anymore. Um, again, this is something that we should not criminalize and as city attorney people or city council people, you know, we make and we take away the ordinances and I think this is one that we should take away because the conduct is not that serious for jail. So I would move that we set this for a public hearing on April 12th. Right, it's been moved properly by Councilmember Jackson. Besides uh, wishing Riverfest would come back, is there any further discussion? <laughs> All right, seeing no further discussion, let's uh, vote on setting the public hearing. Okay, on setting the hearing, Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. 
Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution setting the hearing is adopted. And that takes us to the next one. Uh, Councilmember Jackson introduced an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to repeal chapter 658, section 658.03, a criminal misdemeanor under the general offenses code of the codified ordinances to eliminate annoying persons. The ordinance is referred to for the first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Thank you. I think this might be our most infamous one, annoying persons. I think for the most part, you know, everybody has a joke about it um, and everybody could be guilty and thrown in jail. There was conversation about being willfully annoying, which is part of the statute. You have to willfully annoy somebody. But the concern was twofold. One, that um, annoying is kind of vague and it's kind of hard to determine what exactly that is to criminally prosecute somebody and it could therefore possibly be unconstitutional, including from our city attorney said it could possibly be unconstitutional. Um, there is other um, ordinances and laws like no stalking and no being a disorderly person that could be applied. But here, this one is possibly unconstitutional and I would move to set it for a public hearing on April 12th. Okay. So a proper motion has been made. Um, any further discussion? All right, seeing none, I will ask the clerk to please call roll. On uh, setting the public hearing on 658.03 uh, repeal, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yeah. Eight yeah, yeah, zero nays. The public hearing is set. Takes us to the next one. Councilmember Jackson introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, to repeal. Uh, chapter 658, section 658.06, a criminal misdemeanor, misdemeanor under the General Offenses Code of the Codified Ordinances to eliminate that no person shall beg in any public place or go door to door requesting donations for personal gain. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Uh, Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. This ordinance. Uh, begging in public places, according to our city attorney, is possibly also unconstitutional. There hasn't been any prosecution or charges since 2008, and it was previously decriminalized from, I believe, a past administration. Um, and there are other ordinances that could cover the undesired conduct of maybe somebody being on the, in the street or um, harassing people or touching people or littering or being um, intoxicated in public or any of those things are covered. But begging is probably unconstitutional and we, wouldn't, we shouldn't want to criminalize our population who unfortunately may have to do that and does do that and put them in jail or even have them face prosecution for it. Um, there was no objection from the city attorney's office or Chief Green, and I would move this for a public hearing on April 12th. Thank you, Council Member Jackson. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, let's clerk, please call the roll and say the public hearing. Um, say the public hearing on 658.06. Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. 
Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The public hearing is set. Uh, Um, next, we have 680.03. Uh, Council Member Jackson introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to repeal Chapter 680, Section 680.03, a criminal misdemeanor under the General Offenses Code of the Codified Ordinances to eliminate using profane language in a building or any property adjacent to any building in the city occupied as public, private, or parochial school. The ordinance is read a first time by silent and refer to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. This one, don't worry everybody, because it will not allow for people to cuss a storm up next to a school. Because if you look at our offense ordinances on um, 65002, you cannot disturb the peace or willfully or maliciously make or assist or making any noise, disturbance, or improper diversion, which the peace and quietude of or good order of any private or public or parochial school is disturbed. So that will still be in place where you can't make a disturbance to um, divert from school. But the one that says you can't swear in a building next to a school is the one that we're looking to repeal. There has been no charges made on this in the past that the police chief or the city attorney is aware of, and there were, was no objection to getting rid of it. Like I just mentioned, there's other ordinances that will cover the undesired conduct of cussing out loud and disturbing students. That will still be illegal, but we don't need this ordinance to do it. And I would move for a public hearing for April 12th. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Um, it has been moved. Um, let the record note that Councilmember Dunbar is in a parochial school at the time. Um, <laughs> I'd like to make a comment. I swear to work. <laughs> I just don't swear right now, Councilmember Dunbar. I was going to say, I could probably fund half the city budget if this was actually enforced. So, <laughs> Well, I will remind you that we are on public access and that I would encourage you to follow the law at this for the moment. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm following. <laughs> Very good. Uh, thank you on setting the hearing. Uh, it's been moved by Councilmember Jackson. If we could uh, call the roll, please. Um, on repealing 680.03 public hearing, Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Oh, yeah. Uh, eight yeas, zero nays, the public hearing is set. Uh, so next we have Councilmember Jackson introduced an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to repeal Chapter 680, Section 680.06, a criminal misdemeanor under the General Offenses Code of the Codified Ordinances to eliminate borrowing money or a thing of value from a student at any school. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. So I'll just read the quick paragraph, the whole thing. No person shall borrow or attempt to borrow any money or thing of value from any student in any public, private, or parochial school or in any public, private, or parochial school property in the city or during any time when any such student is going or returning from any regular scheduled session of such school without first obtaining the written approval of the principal of such school or other person designated by the principal. Um, so this is kind of strange. Um, it's very broad and it says anything of value. Um, you can imagine that it is designed for possibly people trying to get money and things from students that's going to and from school. Um, there has been no prosecutions 
that the city attorney or the chief of police is aware of. This is from 1986. And um, there's still other ordinances like no harassing, no stalking, no assaulting people that are applicable here. Um, there was no objection to its repeal and I would move to set it for a public hearing April 12th. Council Member Jackson has made a proper motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Uh, Council Member, uh, Council, Mr. Clerk, you're muted if you were trying to call the roll. Again, we've only been doing like, this. Like I was like, year. "Am I muted? Like, did I do? Did I do it wrong?" <laughs> okay, on setting the hearing for six eighty point zero six, Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. That public hearing is set for April 12th. And that takes us to the final one of the evening. Councilmember Jackson introduced an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to repeal chapter 696, section 696.02, a criminal misdemeanor under the general offenses code of the codified ordinances to eliminate that no person shall carry any firearm, air rifle, bow and arrow, slingshot, crossbow, or other dangerous weapon in any public place. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. So this one is basically illusory in the fact that it doesn't grant or take away anybody any additional gun rights um, that our state law doesn't already prescribe. Uh, Michigan um, exclusively basically regulates the carrying, open carry and concealed carry laws. We already have laws where you can't point a gun or weapon at anybody. That would be a felonious assault, a felony. You can't brandish a weapon or gun or anything where you're like looking menacingly or intimidating people or cussing someone out and having your gun around. You still can't do any of those things and you still can't carry a gun without a concealed weapon without a permit. Um, so this law is basically just saying, follow the state law, which is already set in place. There was some conversation in committee about, well, does the state law cover bow and arrows? Because in this one, you could possibly be charged for carrying a bow and arrow. And we weren't exactly sure about the state, but um, that wasn't enough to prevent it from being moved out of committee. So people don't, don't worry. We're not saying everybody can carry a gun. We're saying you still have to follow the same laws that you always had to follow. And that this ordinance, um, if anything, would risk possibly violating the second amendment if it tries to um, restrict some of the already legal means to carry, but it is not promoting any bad acts with guns because everything bad with a gun is still illegal. It's just that you have to follow the state law. Um, I would move to set a public hearing for April 12th. Thank you the proper motion before public hearing. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I will ask her to call the roll. Okay, on the public hearing for 66.02, Member Jacks? Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Council Member Spitzley? Yes. Council Member Wood? Yes. Council Member Betts? Yes. Council Member Dunbar? Yes. Council Member Garza? Yes. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the public hearing is set. And we will have a fun evening April 12th. Uh, incidentally, folks, I will be absent on April 12th. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, that concludes the uh, ordinance for introduction. Mr. Clark. We are to speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. And again, please um, raise your hand if you wish to address the city council. Um, star nine on a phone, uh, raise hand icon uh, if you can find that. Uh, alternately, you could use press Y at the same time on the Windows or Option and Y on the same time at the same time on an Apple. Um, we will uh, accept additional raised hands uh, up through the first speaker or at least three minutes into speakers. Um, so please begin raising your hand. And again, that's any topic related to the operation or government governance of the city. Uh, you'll have three minutes to speak and uh, it is your time to speak. It is not a question and answer or debate period. It is public comment. Uh, and while folks are getting their hands raised, uh, we are to reports of city officers, boards, and commissions. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Vice President. I would move that all items be considered as, um, or I'm sorry, I would move that all items uh, be considered as read in full and the appropriate referrals be made by you, President Spadafore. Thank you very much. There is proper motion. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Member Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The referrals are authorized. We have items from the city clerk regarding uh, Tri County Regional Planning Commission audit. Committee on Ways and Means. Um, minutes of boards, commissions, and authorities, boards and commissions. Placed on file. Uh, Lansing Economic Development Corporation 2020 Annual Report. Community of on Planning and placed on file. Uh, items from the mayor, uh, setting and show cause hearing and orders for make safe or demolish at 314 Bingham. Community on Public Safety. Um, Act 99 Financing Jackson Field Stadium. Uh, that would be the Committee of the Whole. Uh, ballot Proposal Essential Services Millage Restoration. Committee of the Whole. Uh, the Budget. Committee of the Whole, Internal Auditor. Uh, Public Act 99 Financing Johnson Controls. Committee of the Whole. And items from the Elected Officers Compensation Commission. Setting a public hearing and consideration of an amendment to chapter 280, section 280.03, to provide that the commission shall meet in even numbered years and the corresponding uh, ordinance. We start that in the committee on city operations. Um, the community development block grant. Uh, Item. Committee on the whole. Uh, item from the Board of Water and Light, external auditor for the Lansing Board of Water and Light selection of Baker Tilly. Committee of Ways and Means and our internal auditor as well. Communications and petitions uh, from Joseph Darby about Woodbridge Manor Apartments. Committee on Public Safety. From Lauren Whaley about various city matters. Please place that on file with the council. Um, notice from the Liquor Control Commission Concord Lansing downtown for a transfer of a license um, and various permits under that license. Committee on City Operations. Communication from Downtown Lansing Inc., Rio Town Commercial Association, and Old Town Commercial Association regarding social district boundaries. Committee on City Operations. And we are two remarks by council members. Council members, are there any council members wishing to make remarks? Council Member Wood. Um, thank you. Well, we've been in our council meeting. Um, I know we've had a moment of meditation already, but um, in Boulder, Colorado this evening, there were multiple um, deaths uh, involved in a grocery store shooting along with a police officer um, and 
Um, so if we could remember uh, the residents of that community and what they're going through right now as they are in the process of notifying families of the death of loved ones. Um, I, I think we need to remember that, especially when we were talking about um, issues in our own community. Um, we can see, we see what's happened in another one. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Mm -hmm. um, I just have something unrelated to mention. Um, you saw a communication on um, potential um, Social district boundaries. I know that Council Member Dunbar and the rest of the operations committee will be looking at that very soon. So we're asking folks to reach out to us either through us directly or your, your ward reps or contacting the city council offices with ideas about social district boundaries. Um, I know we don't necessarily have a defined process here for that, um, kind of make it up as we go because that's the nature of this. But um, that's I just want to make sure we put that out there, remind folks that that was coming. Council Member Dunbar. You're muted, council member number, there you go, nope. Yeah, I was, thank you for saying that because I completely forgot about that because I've had so many people that are reaching out to me in different ways. And um, I think those of us on the committee are gonna need to put together a spreadsheet of what we're receiving from where because we don't really have a, a one spot to take this information um, except for, you know, and then we can consider it in committee, but um, yes, please do let us know if there are social districts that you want us to consider for outdoor seating. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I see no other hands. Mr. Clerk, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, do we are to the mayor's comments? Is there any no comments. No. Okay. Public comment on city government related matters. Uh, again, uh, I've gone through a few times tonight how to raise your hand, but raise your hand and we will accept additional raised hands uh, through the first speaker. And uh, the first speaker is Verlisha Kelly, followed by Claretta. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, initially, I had said I wanted to comment on the rezoning. However, um, that has passed. I want to thank you for supporting us in the Churchill Down area. So um, this is an excellent meeting and I'm enjoying it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Floretta followed by Zach Whaley. Can you hear me? Yes. And if you want to give your last name, please feel free. Yes. Claretta Duckett Freeman to black elected, appointed and positional leaders. Accountability is an act of love. Of all 13 Black Lives Matter guiding principles, the one BLM Lansing chose to elevate as our chief guiding principle is loving engagement. It is out of our love for ourselves, our people and our community that we are calling in black leaders who sit at tables of white supremacy, justifying to yourselves that you have more wisdom experience and expertise and those of us in the streets and in our neighborhoods where the pain and trauma are real and visceral. We understand that you believe in cooperation and see compromise as progress. We disagree. We did not ask or give you our consent to speak for us any more than we assert that we speak for you. We are the people. We are the people who don't get invited to tables of white supremacy because we know it is our duty to disrupt transgenerational cycles of trauma and harm. Demanding accountability and results is not an unrealistic expectation. It is what we are owed by our elected officials and institutional leaders in whom power is vested by the people. Perhaps it is because our paths as people building power do not often cross with those of you who take power for granted that we find ourselves at a crossroads. Learning to hear those people with lived experiences creates a better and richer understanding of everyday Black people's problems. Understanding that those closest to the problems are often, often more relative to the solution. All so-called Black leaders must learn to listen to the people. Are you aware that Black Lives Matter called for Andy Shore to resign because of well-documented and publicized harms to Black people? 
how can you sit at a table he created to silence and discredit those who made our demands clear and expect us to remain silent? We have been patient and we have made our concerns known in private conversations out of respect for you. The truth is that you are complicit in the oppression of black people who are evident in our demand to defund the police and to build a community safety system that is accountable to the people. Twisting our demands into reforms that increase police funding and reinforce power and oppressive systems is a disservice to the black community. Allowing white leaders to divide us as a community is a choice. The side you chose places you on the wrong side of history in a time of global uprising and the long overdue reckoning of white supremacy. You have chosen to side with maintaining racial hierarchy and your actions have real consequences for people fighting for justice, for their loved ones and their livelihoods. Thank you. Next we have Zach Whaley followed by Rob Thomas. Hi, thanks. Um, I wanted to join again and just uh, voice my support for Black Lives Matter Michigan and Lansing's call. Um, for everything that Cloretta just read, which I, I love that she read the entire um, press release from BLM um, Lansing today. It was beautifully written and deserves to be here, heard by everybody on this council, especially. Um, one of the points, like she mentioned, is defunding the police. And I know it's something I talk about every week, but it feels especially apparent given some of the topics that we talked about this week or at this meeting. Um, the stats that uh, Councilperson Dunbar was throwing out as far as, and uh, um, Spitzer were throwing out as far as the cost associated with um, what happens when a great harm is done to our community, like um, a shooting or a homicide, right? We're talking hundreds of thousands or in excess of millions of dollars. Yet this one program that costs about a quarter million dollars can stop potentially tens or hundreds of violent acts like that. That's only one of the myriad examples of how far preventative and supportive measures can go, even just from a purely capitalist gross aspect of actually preventing harm and, um, healing in our communities as opposed to just trying to incarcerate them and continue that cycle of harm. Um, again, like all of council persons, uh, Jackson's motions uh, to get rid of these totally useless uh, safety standards, um, safety ordinances are a perfect example of that. Like, I think we can generally agree, like kids probably shouldn't play in the street, right? Like we probably shouldn't be like having loan sharks solicit kids while they're at school. But the question is, are these things that should be legislated and regulated through the penal process? Like, should a kid that's playing in the street, like I used to play hockey when I was in like elementary school with the kids down the road, like, should we all get thrown in jail? Is that the way we want to support our community? If a kid is like somebody is uh, standing next to Jimmy John's and once upon a time there was a, you know, a, uh, a, a working uh, a sex worker there, like, should that person be thrown in jail? Um, it's a lot like white Mike said about, we just need to reframe things outside of this white supremacist box of like our job, the, the job of the state, the job of our government is to support its citizens. It isn't to further ruin their lives by imposing fines and fees and all these hurdles to jump through. Um, I, I talk with my partner daily about clients that she sees who have committed really terrible things against other people and who truly want to be rehabilitated and are forced to go through all these things that just constantly get in the way of their actual healing. And I look to all of you to help be a pro part of that process to reforming that or just abolishing that system. It's not something that can be changed when its intent was punitive to begin with. Um, and again, just looking at from a fiscal standpoint, how much of a return on investment you can get when you actually put the money into the forefront and the supportive measures as opposed to waiting for people to be incapable of supporting themselves. Thank you. Um, next is Rob Thomas followed by Kyle. Thank you. Um, I will actually be continuing where uh, my sister Claretta left off. Have you spoken to any of the nine individuals who have filed racial discrimination lawsuits? If not, is it because you signed a deal with the city of Lansing that binds you to their will and requires you to protect their interests over those who have been harmed? Are you beginning to understand the harm that you are causing? As long as there are black leaders who are willing to 
lend their credibility and respectability to cover racial discrimination, there will be no accountability. Without accountability, there will be no transformation, only public relations and political posturing. New programs will be created and your organizations, friends and children will get opportunities that others will never know existed. Literally on the backs of those who have been in city council every week for the past year, in addition to being in the streets, risking our lives, fighting for those whose needs will continue to go unmet. What would you do if you were in our shoes? What is your duty as a black leader? Where is your accountability to those who claim who you claim to represent? We invite you to come to the community table and give an account to begin healing and building across experiential, economic, and generational divides. We know that you too experience micro and macro aggressions because of your proximity to whiteness. We know what it means to have our value determined by our willingness to nod, smile, and go along to get along. We are calling you home. Our ancestors sacrificed much and fought hard for us to make quote unquote, good trouble. It is time for you to join the fight for black liberation and stop working to undermine a global movement. Our invitation to accountability, acknowledge the harm perpetrated by the Andy Shore administration, publicly state that you do not agree or align with the values of white supremacy and tactics that undermine accountability, divest from work with and support of Shore's administration. This letter is being released on Black Lives Matter Lansing social media, distributed to news media, and will be sent to each individual we have identified as undermining the grassroots community's voices. In love, truth, and justice, the collective membership of Black Lives Matter Lansing. That being said, with my last 30 seconds, Mr. Betts, you said that if the citizens of the first ward were to state that they do not want you on this council, you would go ahead and resign. I believe it has been very evident that they have done so, sir. And I think that you need to address yourself as a person and do what is accordingly right. Because right now it seems like you show up to these meetings for a paycheck. And that adds to the egregiousness of everything you have done to this city. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next, we have Kyle, and feel free to state your last name, uh, followed by Michael Lim Jr. Uh, last name's Richard, R-I-C-H-A-R-D. Uh, I want to say thank you to Clerk Swope for our correspondence a few weeks ago. I know I never got back to you. Uh, I'm not sure if there's fruit there. Um, I want to say thank you to Councilman Jackson for the fourth order. I sent, him, sent you an email tonight. Um, if you're not signed up for the fourth order, you can email him at bryant.jackson at uh, lansingmi.gov. The, moving on, uh, Brandon, please resign. Um, I don't live in the first ward, so you don't technically have to listen to me. Uh, but your story about feeling betrayed by a friend after you'd sacrificed your career for this movement is frustrating to me because if you had truly sacrificed your career for this movement, where was the vote of no confidence against Mayor Andy Short, right? Like if, if you truly wanted to sacrifice your career for this movement, you could have been persistent and it, it, who cares if no one else votes for it? Get them on the record. Make people vote on this issue because it's important to the city. It's important to the people. But no, you're, we're not going to do that. And then we're going to let everyone else know that we were the ones that were betrayed. Um, uh, Andy, so, uh, you said you're going to have a conversation with the chief tomorrow regarding the uh, backyard incident. Uh, while you're there, if you could also mention the new security cameras downtown. Um, the one, I'm specifically referring to the ones that are in front of Kazacheks and PNC. Um, they don't seem to match the rest of the cameras. They, they look like they're, I mean, if you haven't seen them, they're about the size of like a tennis ball tube and they're like 12 feet off the ground, right? They look like you bought them at police states R us, right? Like, I don't, I don't know I don't, I don't, I don't like, I work downtown. 
And when I walk downtown and with those cameras around, I don't feel safe. I, I feel like I am living in an oppressive police state. Um, like if you, if, if, if your worry is, you know, to protect the business owners, that's fine. But at the same time, we need to understand that that's a reactionary measure, right? You have people in the community that are basically begging for, I mean, at this point demanding like real change, right? Real, like, like let's actually get our hands dirty change. And your reaction is, well, let's put up, like the reaction of the city is like, let's put up more cameras, right? It's, it's, it's this punitive thing. Like, and so I don't, I really don't understand what you're going for. Um, please resign, defund the police, uh, arrest the cops who killed Anthony Elon. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, next we have Michael Lynn Jr. followed by Erica Lynn. Hello, obviously uh, Andy Shore resigned, um, but I'm gonna get into some more deep stuff. Yesterday, uh, Andy Shore's wife put out a big long email to all his supporters to let him know that Andy will be starting his campaign on March 21st. Um, or excuse me, I think it was March 20th, his birthday was. March 21st, uh, he went out to campaign on Anthony Hulon's birthday or what would have been Anthony Hulon's birthday. I've heard this council come on here disgracefully, it pisses me off so bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> And you guys continuously give honor to people in Colorado whose families have passed. Have you all talked to the Hulan family? Have you spoken to Heather Hulan and heard the cry in her voice, the tears, while she's holding us for her 80-year-old parents? There's information that's been released to her only that she cries through nights, calls me two in the morning to talk about because she can't release this information to her parents because her parents just wouldn't be able to handle it. Where is your guys' representation for them? Brandon Betts, I wasn't even going to acknowledge you on here, but that was your constituent. He lived in the first ward. We're so easy to reach outside of our own community to contact issues and talk about thoughts and prayers. Andy Shore to look outside of his office for racism. What is wrong with you people? You are just citizens of the city. I know most of you personally. You guys are good people when we talk on the phone. When we come on here, I just don't understand where the real love is. Most of you all show me day in and day out that you care about the city when it's comfortable for you. If what you're seeing today with Black Lives Matter and what you're going to see over the next year, you all that are up for these elected positions this year and next year and the following years, the world has changed. You're no longer going to be able to go and pander to pastors. They are not going to matter. Their words, their voices are not going to matter. The people are standing up. And we're not asking for nothing specific or anything crazy. We're asking to stop dying. Thank you, Brian T. Jackson, for bringing off those rules that will only be used against black and brown people when they don't use discretion when dealing with us. The same way that I got fired from the Lansing Fire Department, because they got a book two inches deep of rules, just like what Brian T. Jackson just removed, that they'll only use when they feel like using them against people who they don't like or they want to discriminate against. We got four officers that are still working in that jail who killed somebody. What training could you guys possibly afford to train murder out of them? But we're going to thoughts and prayers for Colorado shootings and the police officer that died there. But I've not one time heard any of you just so easily state Heather Hulon, the Hulon family, my condolences to you all. Not once. Not once. But I hear her cries. I hear her tears because she has got no justice. Y'all got to do better, man. Thank you. Um, next is Erica Lynn, followed by Julia Kramer. I would like to um, echo in support of the letter that was read by Clara Duckman, uh, as well as Rob. Um, I support that fully. Um, it's a great, you know, invitation to accountability um, that I think can apply to a few different areas. Um, real quick, I do, I also wasn't going to acknowledge um, Beth's presence here, but I feel like it's something that we have to address because I think it's a bigger picture as far as, um, I've said it before, him even being here. Uh, he did state that, you know, if his constituents wanted him to resign, you know, he would but then really didn't follow up on how that process would go. Um, I am a member of the first ward. 
I have called for his resignation, will officially do so now. Um, and just to fully state, it wasn't simply your disgusting words, your violent words, your actions. It wasn't even your inaction. It wasn't even just your refusal to listen to the people's voices and to trust Black voices. It is literally the foundation that you are built upon, Brandon Betts, that emboldened you to think those thoughts, to say those words, and to act on them. That is a problem. That is an inherent issue on who you are as a person. So therefore, you are not equipped to hold that seat to speak for the people in the ways that you stated you would do so when you campaigned for the votes. Um, so I stand by the resign, uh, Brandon Betts. Um, equally important, if not more, <sighs> propaganda. The, the Andy Shore resignation that's always been on the table, it has never left. Um, I know it's election season, but I want to take the opportunity to invite Andy Shore into a true accountability conversation because the trauma and the harm and the irreparable damage that your administration under your awful leadership has perpetuated just cannot be fixed. Can't be fixed with appointed alliances, can't be fixed with photo ops, volunteering around the city, throwing money at churches and orgs and nonprofits. It simply cannot be fixed that way. And I want to point out that when we talk about justice, because you use that word a lot, you named your alliance justice, the racial equity, just racial justice and equity alliance, right? Do you even know what restorative justice is? I'll give you a really quick crash course because this is what you need to do. This is what you should have done. Number one, when you cause harm, you need to give a voice to those affected by the harm and you invite dialogue with those people. Number two, you work towards healing by addressing the harm. You have not done that. Number three, you seek direct accountability because anyone that's causing harm should be held accountable to the people that they've harmed. Number four, you need to repair the division that your harm has caused because your words and your actions have created division. They have created distrust in the community and you need to fix that. Number five, you need to strengthen the individuals and the community to prevent that further harm. If you have not done that, it is not justice. Election season doesn't give you a clean slate just to campaign on. You don't get to just sweep it back under the rug and act like it never happened by not putting in any work to actually repair that harm. You still need to resign. Thank you. Uh, next we have Julia Kramer followed by Ethan Schmidt. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I would like to uplift uh, the invitation to accountability from Black Lives Matter that was read earlier. I really appreciate those words and I wanna just voice my, my um, support for that uh, statement. Um, Brian, I wanna say thank you so much for bringing these ordinances to the Council for Repeal. Um, I think this is really exciting um, and is a step in the right direction. Uh, Brandon, you owe your constituents in Ward 1, including myself and all Lansing residents, at least a public statement about your harmful behavior and an apology. Um, I agree that you should resign. I would really like to see you publicly take responsibility for the harm that you've caused. Um, it's really uh, disheartening to just see these meetings go on as normal, um, as if no harm has occurred, um, and not see a public response. So I really would love to see that from you um, as someone who supported you. And um, yeah, I'd really love to see that. So uh, I really, <laughs> I'm really uh, excited by all these conversations about accountability. I think that, you know, particularly in these times, all we have is each other and we have to keep each other accountable so that we can build trust and continue to work for a better future for our city. So I really appreciate everything that you guys do. Thank you so much. Um, and that's all I have, thanks. Thank you. And then finally, we have Ethan Schmidt. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I wanna to start by thanking Brian T. Jackson for the really great work helping to update the code and make it um, make it a lot better. I hope this work continues. I know it can be very tedious and challenging. And I know that it's not really going to be a lot of fun to be at public hearings, but it is the work that ultimately makes a lot of difference toward the city's operation and justice in the city as well. Um, so I hope that this goes beyond just laws that are obsolete and goes into laws that are actively damaging as well. And I hope the work continues. I hope we continue to go through this and that um, we continue to, to push forward. There will always be people who panic 
immediately the second a law might be repealed, as you saw on this call, even though there was essentially nothing controversial about what was being proposed. It couldn't have been a more Manila uh, repeal. And there were still people who called in and sounded panicked about the idea that we could repeal any law. So I hope that that doesn't scare you off from continuing to do things like this, because honestly, it doesn't matter what you do that's going to happen. And so you might as well continue to do the good things. Um, I would also like to, of course, sit in here in support of Black Lives Matter and um, encourage the council and the mayor to reimagine policing, reimagine a society in which we don't punish people. We try to rehabilitate, we try to support, and we try to attack the problem at the source where people don't feel as if they are trapped into crimes. We don't have people going from school to prison and we don't have a, a society where a punishment is, e even the punishments themselves are unequal given that a $200 fine means a lot more to someone making minimum wage than someone making millions of dollars. We have to do the hard work of reimagining this and we have to continue to support grassroots movements that stand up where others don't have the courage to even at great personal cost, as we see with Michael Lynn losing, losing his job um, over an issue that I still think is a, at best extreme, extreme sensitivity from Daryl Green. And I think we need to do better. So thank you for listening. Thank you for all you do. And uh, thank, you, thank you for listening. Thank you. That was our final speaker for the evening. Very good. That concludes the business for the council. And at 1031 p.m., we are adjourned.